Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have a great crowd. We have, uh, I think, 90 plus uh, signed up for today. Plus, we have probably as many viewing it. I have, a, I have as many emails as, as well. Uh, you know, viewing us. So, for everybody out there, say hello. Everybody turn around and say hello. hello. <laughs> Uh, have a great uh, lineup of speakers, and I'm not going to uh, take too much of the time introducing uh, everybody. I'm, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and uh, I just want to take one quick poll so that uh, David went back there. Everybody turn around look at David. Um, our session today is from 9 to about 1, to 1, and then there's a second session on investments. Not everybody needs to stay for that, but I need to know more or less how many folks are will stay for that so that we can kind of make arrangements for copies and what have you. So uh, if I show hands, uh, kind of give me an uh, indication of who will be staying after. For the next session? For the second session. Uh, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. About 12 to 15. Okay, about 15 more or less, uh, so we'll make arrangements for, for, for the after session. So uh, again, welcome, and uh, we're going to get started, and Mark has been here before, so he's no stranger to us, and uh, I know we'll probably see him at uh, South Padre. Uh, when is it? Yes, the end of September. Well, he'll tell you all about it, so I'll be welcome, Mark Rogers. <coughs> Testing. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Oh, there. Uh, good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you this morning. And uh, I, I guess we're all on candid cameras, so we'll need to be on our best behavior. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, best practices for public purchasing. And um, just a little bit of introduction. I was in public purchasing. I started out at the Austin Community College. Uh, and the Austin Community College District actually shared a board with the Austin Independent School District. So my first 10 years, I was in the Community College District, but I was operating under the same purchasing laws as school districts in Texas and also had the same board as uh, the school district there. Uh, went on from there to the University of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque and then came back to Austin Austin Independent School District and uh, spent my last 24 years in public purchasing there. I am a certified purchasing manager. Uh, I've been speaking at purchasing conferences uh, fairly consistently since 1981. I've been retired now for five years and boy time flies. I uh, still do a little bit of speaking and enjoy the opportunity to get out uh, and I, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to come down and, and speak with y'all. Uh, Jesus didn't mention it, but we first met when he was at Laredo, and uh, I came down to Laredo and did this, and he was kind enough when he moved up here to invite me to, to come up here. And I, I do appreciate the opportunity. I hope you guys will enjoy the session. Uh, what I'm trying to do is kind of touch what I feel like are the high points, the most important points that you can cover in an hour for public purchasing. If you have any questions, or e even if you have a disagreement, please speak up. Uh, audience participation is, uh, I think, fun for me, and it's fun for y'all. Uh, starting out here, the first thing I'm going to mention is ethics, and uh, I'll just kind of hit the high points. I think all of y'all ought to have, if you don't, ought to have a code of ethics adopted by your uh, entity. It is not by any, yeah, you can't hear? Okay, it is not by any means universal. There are some exceptions, but uh, I know a number of CPA firms, when they come in and do your external audit, they're actually asking to see what your code of ethics is. And furthermore, once you get it adopted, you make, need to make sure that people are aware of what it is and where it is and that it's it's part of the training that you provide to your both your purchasing staff and your uh, customers. 
Uh, again, I'm going to kind of hit the high points. I've got a, a generic code that I've uh, used for a number of years. I think it covers most of the points you need to cover, and there's just a few nuances that I'm going to emphasize. The first item up here is avoid the intent and appearance of unethical or compromising practice in relationships, actions, and communications. I think the key word here, and the one that people probably pay the least attention to, but ought to pay the most attention to, is the appearance. You know, what, what the old saying, perception is 90% of reality. Uh, if, if you are doing something that appears to onlookers, uh, to be unethical, even if it's perfectly straight up and legit, it's going to cause you problems. So you need to avoid the appearance of unethical or, or compromising practice. And something that might appear unethical is if you're attending a Houston Texans game, and I hope it ended better than when I turned it off, but uh, no, okay. If you're attending a Houston Texans game, and you're with a major vendor that your jurisdiction does a lot of business with, people that see y'all together, the competitors of that major vendor, are not gonna think that y'all are there on a Dutch street type kind of basis. So those are the kinds of things you wanna avoid. Also remember, you don't wanna see yourself on the evening news on TV, and you don't wanna see yourself in the newspaper, because 99% of the time when you do, it's not good news. The second one here is demonstrate loyalty to your employer by diligently following the lawful instructions of your employer using reasonable care and only authority granted. There's two things, or actually three things here I'd say. Number one, lawful instructions. If your employer tells you to do something that is illegal, you got a problem and you don't want to go to jail over it. Number two, use reasonable care. That doesn't mean that you've got to do 800 hours of research on a $50 purchase. Reasonable care. And the last thing is uh, exercise only authority granted. Don't exceed the author your, your authority, because if you do, once again, you can get in trouble. The next one on here is refrain from any private business or professional activity that would create a conflict between personal interests and those of your employer. Uh, hopefully, you guys are not having to work a second job. But if you are, be careful, make sure that it does not conflict with uh, the interests of your employer. And uh, also, they're, they're, sometimes you get an instance where folks are actually selling to their employer. That is not a good thing. You don't want to be doing that kind of thing. And you don't want to have one of your family members uh, selling to your employer. Uh, the next one is refrain from soliciting or accepting money, loans, credits, discounts, gifts, entertainment, favors, or services from present or potential suppliers. You know, that seems like it's, it's a real no-brainer, but it's actually not. I got myself in a jam one time. I was with the, um, the school district, and uh, I'm a juvenile, they call them now, type 1 diabetic, and uh, somebody who knew of my uh, medical history uh, asked me if I would be willing to serve on the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation local board. And I thought, well, that means, you know, I can maybe help them some with financial things and just giving them good advice and so on and so forth. And I agreed to do it. But it didn't take too long to find out that the major emphasis of being on that board was fundraising. Well, there's, there's a clear problem there because if I'm fundraising, even if it's the best uh, how do you say cause in the world, if I'm fundraising for a cause that's near and dear to me, and even if it, it, it's as American as apple pie and all that, I've got a real problem if I go to a vendor and ask him to contribute some money or some other kind of support for that cause, as long as I'm a purchasing agent for a, a public jurisdiction like I am, because that the vendor could assume that his willingness to contribute to this charitable cause could affect his ability to get business with my school district. So I very quickly resigned from it and felt really stupid. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Um, the next one is handle confidential or proprietary information with due care and proper consideration of ethical and legal ramifications and governmental regulations. That's harder now than it used to be. Used to be most everything and most every contract and most every bid document was public information. 
but more and more you're having vendors who will say X, Y, and Z. They may even say the whole thing is proprietary, you know. Uh, you got to be real careful with that, okay? And lots of times, uh, particularly in larger jurisdictions, will have a public information officer, and you might bounce that off of them, and you may even get in a position where you need to check with your own legal staff. Um, the next one is promote positive supplier relationships through courtesy and impartiality. That's kind of a no-brainer. That's one of the main things that we're supposed to be doing in public purchasing, is being impartial and being fair and honest with everybody we deal with. Uh, the next one is know and obey the letter and spirit of laws governing the purchasing function and remain alert to the legal ramifications of purchasing decisions. And there, folks, used to be when I first started in this business uh, back in 1974, the purchasing laws for school districts and community colleges was less than a half a page. I mean, it was basically Section 21901 of the Education Code, and it basically said if, it's, if you're spending more than five grand, bid it, period. There weren't any alter, uh, alternates, or no alternatives, and furthermore, even if it was sole source, there was no sole source exception. It just said bid it. Real simple. And it was easy to memorize, and I, I, I did memorize it. But now we got probably a couple of hundred pages, and it's scattered a zillion different places in the uh, uh, various purchasing laws, whether it's the, the local government code or whether it's the Texas Education Code or whatever. So you can't memorize it all. But what you can do is be familiar with it, know where to look, and know when to seek legal counsel. And last but not least, you really need to avoid feeling like you've got to be able to give somebody a definitive answer the second they come up with the question. There's nothing wrong with telling somebody, I need to double check on that, make sure I give you good information. That's a whole lot better, better than winging it. Uh, sec segment on this page, ensure that all segments of society have the opportunity to participate in government contracts. That is one of the really key differences between public sector purchasing, which is what we're in, and the private sector. We don't get, generally speaking, to choose who participates. Our, our job, frankly, and sometimes it makes it a lot more difficult, is to make as many people as possible aware and have it be as easy to participate as possible for our taxpayers and vendors. The number nine on this 10-point uh, hit list is uh, discourage purchasing office involvement in employer-sponsored programs of personal purchases which are not business-related. You got to be careful with that, okay? Uh, there, there will be some rare occasions where your entity will want to have a program set up for you to be, you and other employees to be able to buy off contracts, but you got to be very careful with that. Number 10, enhance the stature of the purchasing profession by improving your technical knowledge and adhering to the highest ethical standards. Well, the fact that you guys are here means you, 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 you're paying attention to that. And that's real important. I think uh, sometimes we get so busy, we say, well, we don't have time to attend some kind of uh, continuing education or professional development. And the truth of the matter is, you can learn stuff at, at, at these uh, networking type opportunities that will make your job easier and make you more productive. That will give you more time. Um, one, one of the biggest things and one of the best things, in my opinion, about public purchasing is the fact that we can network, we can share information, and we don't have to be inventing the wheel every time we go out to buy something. And that's, that, again, is very different from the private sector. Okay? The next one on here is cooperative purchasing. Um, co yes, sir? Uh, on ethics, uh, in, in none of your points did you mention the dollar value. Uh, and I know sometimes ethics doesn't really distinguish dollars $50 or $1,000, but in your practice, through the years, have you ever considered like going to lunch uh, with someone and if it's under $25, it's, it's okay? 
Uh, the question is, uh, do we do we have should we have some sort of threshold at which uh, a, a gift or entertainment would be acceptable or not acceptable? Um, I think one of the reasons I didn't mention the dollar value is um, what, what, for some people something that's nominal value uh, is you know I'll do gifts first, like a wall calendar. That's no big deal. But somebody else could say, hey, if I'm a computer vendor from Hewlett Packard and I come in and see you've got a Dell calendar on your wall, it doesn't give me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, as far as lunch, I would tell you personally, I think you ought to have a policy to cover it. And I've got a sample policy in my uh, uh, handout, if you will. Uh, but the, the safest thing is, if you don't feel comfortable with it, and you wouldn't feel comfortable if some other vendor saw you with this vendor at lunch, don't go. Um, okay, cooperative, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about this when we get into the sample policy. Uh, cooperative purchasing. Everybody benefits. It doesn't matter how big you are or how small you are. You will get some benefit from participating in cooperative purchasing. Okay, uh, it does tend to have an averaging effect, and by that I mean if you're a very small jurisdiction, let's say you're in Mule Shoe, Texas, you will benefit hugely from cooperative purchasing because the really big buyers will help drive the price down on cooperative purchases. So you'll, you'll benefit hugely. The really big buyer, on the other hand, will benefit much less because he can, on his own, get good pricing but even the really big buyer occasionally will save money by cooperative purchasing in terms of lower prices and certainly can save money in terms of a backup or an alternate or a way to get something done quickly you know you're going to have people if they haven't done it yet they're going to come to you they need to buy something right away if you don't have a contract having a, a cooperative purchasing agreement available to you can really save your, your, your day. So it can benefit you in that way, and it can also benefit you in terms of uh, giving you something to compare things with. Um, I got up here, toolbox. Cooperative purchasing is, is a tool. It's something to have available. It's a method or a means to get something done. Uh, I can remember times, uh, as, as an example, uh, back when we had a, a paper shortage contrived or otherwise we had uh, prices going up on paper and, and supplies were scarce and all of a sudden uh, state contract vendors didn't have any paper at state contract price but they did if you had another contract so you know it, it's it's nice to be able if you've got a supplier who goes out of business and you know they're not going to tend to tell you that we're going out of business tomorrow that's not the kind of thing you're going to do they're not going to give you notice it's, it's typically a very abrupt thing, and you're sitting there, all of a sudden, you, you're in your canoe, and they just took your paddle away, okay? You need to have another way to get to shore, and a lot of times, uh, belonging to one or more cooperatives can provide you that means to get to shore. Um, I got on here, all contracts are not created equal. There are some cooperative purchasing contracts that are poor, and there are some that are really good. And it behooves you, if you're going to live and die by that contract, to do due diligence and make sure that what's on there will work for you. Um, I, I, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but I am going to mention a couple of examples. Uh, the musical instrument contract that the state of Texas had, the musical instruments on there, even, I guess they were set up for prisoners. I don't know. And I guess prisoners don't need very good quality musical instruments. But our, our our music people wouldn't have accepted them for sixth graders, much less aspiring uh, symphony type people. So, you know, be, be careful in that. Uh, just, just recognize the fact that all contracts are not created equal, and if somebody else set that up, it behooves you to take a look at it before signing the dotted line. Uh, lastly, a lot of times when you need something and you need it badly, you can contact the supplier and say, hey, this assumes you don't already have your own contract. But you can contract a super contact a supplier and say, hey, I need such and such. Do you have your product on a cooperative, you know, a cooperative contract that I can use? If he says he does, 
I hate to say it, but the old Reagan thing, trust but verify. Check with the cooperative people and find out. Make sure it's a current contract. Okay. All right. The next one up here is cross training. And this is something that is really unpopular. Nobody wants to do it. They just don't. It, it takes people out of their comfort zone, uh, but it's, it's very important. You need to have at least two people that are capable of performing every task. Okay? Now, if you're in a really, really small governmental entity, and maybe there's one person in the purchasing office, there needs to be somebody somewhere else that can, that can back you up if, God forbid, you should win the lottery and not show up to work the next day. And I know most of y'all would keep working anyway. Unless it was a Powerball, then you might, uh, then you might phone it in. But, or even worse, maybe something should happen and you should contract some illness or something. There needs to be somebody else that can do your job. If you're a bigger jurisdiction, if there's three or four or five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten buyers, whatever, then it's a lot easier. But there always needs to be at least two people. And I'm not saying they're all going to do it equally. If Jane if buys a certain commodity every day, year in, year out, she's going to have more expertise and more knowledge of that commodity than, say, Jimmy, who hasn't bought it in years. But there needs to be somebody who knows how to do the things that are done in your office. There needs to be a backup person. And what that means is you, you need to have a desk manual so there's some documentation of what kind of tasks are performed and how to perform, it, perform them and contact numbers and so on and so forth. And there also needs to be an opportunity at least once a year and people are going to go, they're going to grow when you tell them they've got to switch jobs with somebody for a week. They're, they're going to hate it. But it's important. There needs to be somebody else who can do the job because it's not acceptable when a superintendent calls and says, hey, I need such and such for you to say, well, I'm sorry, uh, we can't do that this week because Jane's on vacation or she hit the lottery or something like that. Because if you come up with that kind of response to the superintendent, you need to hit the lottery. <laughs> Okay, uh, any questions on this? This is important. It's something that not enough people do. And it, it, part of the reason is people don't like doing it. You don't like asking people to do what they don't want to do. People want to do stuff that they're good at. And they're, they're uncomfortable doing something that they're not that familiar with. But it's important. Okay. Um, the next one up here is customer orientation and refresher training. Uh, this is something also that I don't think folks do enough of, um, but all new employees should attend it. So when you get somebody new to your school district um, and they're going to have any kind of responsibility for purchasing, they, they should attend this, this training. Okay. Um, and long-time employees should receive some kind of refresher at least every three years. Because, you know, if, if particularly if they've been there 10 years, they may, not, they may not have looked at a policy in 10 years. And then the last thing I've got on here is withhold the keys. If people don't attend training, then what you can do is you can tell them, hey man, we can't let you be driving this purchasing machine unless you're trained. And that's really easy to do if you've got some kind of automated system. You just don't give them the how to do it. You don't give them the password or whatever. Everybody with me on that? This is important. Make sure that these people are trained. I, I think training is one of the areas where we tend to fall down on. Okay. Customer surveys. I don't know how many of you guys do customer surveys. They're a whole lot easier now than they used to be. But there's a couple of things. First off, they need to be brief. I got, I got a survey from our Austin paper, it's Austin American Statesman. And I got a survey because I, you know, I pay them, what, uh, 40 bucks a month for a subscription. 
So they wanted me to fill out this survey, and I'm the kind of guy, I, for one thing, I'm retired, so I got time to do it, right? And, and I feel like it's something that maybe if I can give them some positive comments, maybe it'll result in a better, better product. Well, I got, the deeper I got into that survey, the more I was in it. It had 50 questions, and it took a while to do. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, one of the biggest problems with this survey is it's way too long. There's a lot of people that are just going to turn the, they're, they're going to turn the computer off. They're going to go go somewhere else, but they're not going to finish that survey. So keep them brief. Shouldn't take long. Second thing, make it easy. It, you know, but you can do. They've got uh, things called Survey Monkey and other organizations where they you can set up a survey real easy and. If you don't want to go to that kind of links, you can send pick pick some people and send them an email. Send out on your email list, you know, what, what these questions that you have are. Uh, lastly, share the results with the suppliers. And, and I'm talking, for example, let's say you've got a contract for widgets, and you want to find out are the widgets coming in on time? Are they what people expected? Are they good quality? Are they having problems with returns? Any of that kind of stuff. You want to have that kind of information come back to you and then if, it, if things aren't going well you need to tell the suppliers so they're not blindsided when it comes time to renew and if things are going well people like to get a pat on the back so either way you need to share the information gifts and entertainment set limits uh, you can have a policy that, that, that has if you want a specific dollar amount you want to address things like, oh, these are the kind of the key points, the stuff we can cover an hour. You want to address key things like a business lunch and a supplier plant visit. Those are two key things. Uh, a sample policy, you could say employees may not accept gifts or excessive entertainment from a vendor. Gifts include any items not obviously of an advertising nature. And I have seen policies that said $5, $10, $25. Uh, the best thing about having a policy, though, is then you, you're not sitting out there on the end of that branch by yourself. Okay? If you've got a policy and you're adhering to that policy, you're covered if there's some criticism. It still may not look good, but at least you've got a track to run on. You've got some support. Um, last thing on here is excessive entertainment includes transportation other than of a business nature in transportation beyond city limits and overnight accommodations. Um, my personal feeling is, as, as regards supplier plant visits, it is almost never necessary for you to visit a supplier's plant and go out of town to do it. And if it is, if it's important enough for you to do that, it ought to be important enough for your employer to pay your expenses to do it. Uh, I was in public purchasing for uh, about 35 years, and I only had a couple of occasions where it was necessary, uh, and I went on my employer's dime. Um, there was a circumstance in the city of Austin back many, many years ago. This, some of you all may remember the company, the Saturn Copier Company, which is, uh, I think later on was absorbed by RICO uh, and a bunch of buyers from the University of Texas and state purchasing which at that time I think was called purchasing and general services they decided to go to New York to look at some copiers and sadly paid for it the TV and newspaper people got hold of it and it turned out that every single machine they saw in New York they could have seen in Austin it didn't play well the public didn't like it Okay, life cycle costing. Uh, this is something that, you know, it, for a while it was all the raves, and then people said, you know, kind of let it go by the wayside, and then it's kind of wavered in and out. But basically, what life cycle costing is, it's considering when you make a purchase, all of the significant, and it's significant is important here, the significant costs over the life cycle of the product. And one of my best examples for when life cycle costing is important is if you've got an item that maybe it costs $5,000, 
and you're going to use it for five years, but it's going to cost three or four or five thousand dollars a year to service. Then service costs are actually going to be a greater dollar commitment than the purchase price. If you're buying the item strictly based on the purchase price, you are buying the tip of the iceberg. You're evaluating the purchase based on what you can see above the surface. Um, it's kind of like people can give you a razor and they make the money on the razor blades. You buy the, you, you buy the razor competitively, but you're stuck with the buying blades down the road. So we need to think long term. Okay, think about significant costs. Don't get hung up in the minutia. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example of that. I've seen people evaluate major equipment purchases, and for example, they might evaluate a, a large copier or printer, and they would evaluate it, and they would consider things even, even down to how many BTUs of heat the copier generated so that they would determine how many air conditioning dollars they would have to spend to counter the heat. I mean, that's getting ridiculous. But the major purchases, I think, should be considered on these, these uh, purchases where you've got a lot of down the road costs. Okay, so if you're buying equipment and there's gonna be significant service costs or supply costs down the road, consider those up front. And you can do that. You can ask the vendor to guarantee you what service costs will be with a not to exceed them, uh, how do you say, escalator. And you can also ask them to guarantee supply costs with a not to exceed uh, escalator. And, and consider those kind of things when you're making the purchase. Uh, last but not least, you got sole source concerns. I see people lots of times, they will buy something, and then once they buy the equipment, they're locked in. They've got to buy the service or the supplies from that same vendor. And again, they, they bought the equipment competitively perhaps, but if they didn't consider the down the road cost to supply or service it, they got a problem. One example of that I saw a while back was people buying, have y'all seen, the, I'm sure you have, uh, these paper towel dispensers where you wave your hand and magically the thing dispenses three or four feet of paper. Hopefully not three or four feet, but whatever, whatever they set it up for. Uh, I see people, you know, they sign these contracts for these paper dispensers and they don't consider the fact that that dispenser that they just signed a monthly contract for, they may be on the hook for paper for a long period of time and, and, and big dollars. So think long term. It's kind of like driving in your car. You want to be seeing not just 20 feet in front of you, but 200 feet in front of you. Okay, networking. Um, what I'm going to say here, the fact that you're here means you are doing some networking, and that's a good thing. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, that I think is really good about networking is it gives us an opportunity to avoid reinventing the wheel. I don't care how much expertise you have on a particular product or how much expertise you have on buying in general. If you start from scratch on a purchase and you start from scratch writing specifications, you will almost certainly omit something or find something that you could have done better if you had started with somebody else's wheel, okay? So again, enjoy one of the big benefits of public purchasing. Ask your colleagues, when you get ready to buy something you haven't bought before, pick up the phone or send somebody an email and say, hey, have you bought such and such? If you have, could I see your specifications? And people will share that kind of stuff with you, unlike the private sector. So don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the next thing on here is references. Um, if somebody, if a vendor calls you and asks if they can use you as a reference, it's important that you allow them to do that and tell them that I will provide factual information about my experience with your product or service. I will not do an endorsement. Now, a reference might be, yes, I bought 100 of these chairs four years ago, and thus far they proved serviceable. That's a reference. An endorsement would be, this is the best damn chair in the free world. 
I'd stake my life on it. I would never go into combat without this chair. You don't want to be doing endorsements just like you don't want to be going into combat. References are okay, not endorsements. Okay, pre-bid conferences. I don't know how many of you guys do pre-bid conferences. Uh, this is something I think we probably don't do enough. But particularly if you're going to be buying something that you haven't bought on a regular basis and you are concerned that there might be some pitfalls out there, there might be some ambiguities, then doing a pre-bid is good. The only downside of it is it adds a little time to the length of the procurement process. A couple of pointers though, you should make them convenient. You should not make a pre-bid mandatory. And I hear people groan when I say that. But if you make attendance at a pre-bid conference mandatory and only one guy shows up, what have you done? You just might as well just hand them your wallet. Doesn't matter what they bid, they're the only bidder, right? If you get two guys, what have you done? You've set up an opportunity for collusion. As soon as they leave your pre-bid, they go get a beer and they talk about, you know, you, you, be this, you bid this and I'll bid that and we'll split the difference. So we don't want them to be mandatory. Now people say, well, it's really important that they attend. Well, then it's really important that you let them know it's important that they attend. You might even say that their attendance at, or, or lack of attendance at a pre-bid could affect the decision on to whom recommend award. But telling them they absolutely positively cannot bid unless they attend a pre-bid conference puts you in a box. And we don't want to be in a box. Next, allow respondents adequate time to review the invitation. If you publish the solicitation on Monday, you don't want to have the pre-bid on Tuesday. Give them time to read it and be, be ready to ask questions. Next, allow attendees to question. You know, the purpose of a pre-bid is to uh, find out if there's any ambiguities or something that needs clarification. What you should do, though, is you shouldn't try to amend the invitation at the conference. Have somebody from the using department on hand that can hear the questions, take notes, and then after the pre-bid is over, if an addendum is necessary, issue an addendum, and that addendum will go to everybody, not just the ones that attended the pre-bid. Uh, lastly, issue, well, issue a written addendum if necessary to all respondents. Any questions on pre-bid? Procurement cards. How many of you guys use procurement cards? Not very many. I'm surprised. Well, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I think that uh, procurement cards are a good tool. I think they can get you in trouble, but I, I think they're a good tool. I think more and more they're probably going to be necessary. I've heard some people call them payment cards instead of procurement cards. I know there's vendors who will not accept purchase orders. Um, I, I think sometimes when we refuse to accept purchase orders, we put ourselves in a position, or, or do business with a company that won't accept purchase orders, we put ourselves in a position of maybe paying more for a product than we should. So I think probably procurement cards are something that uh, more and more is going to be commonly used and I think can be a good tool. A couple of three points. If you get into them, make sure you got plenty of training. That's an area where I think a lot of people, when they implement procurement cards, they fall down on. Um, Dallas ISD, a number of years ago, got into huge trouble with their procurement cards. In fact, they were the poster child for the bad boys in procurement cards. Um, they didn't have enough training. They didn't have enough restrictions. And there should be restrictions set up, and they should be clear. Uh, something else they should have done, in my opinion, was they should have built a supplier base rather than saying you can use procurement cards for anything with anybody. Um, I think the way to do procurement cards, if you're going to implement them, is you start out small and then as, as folks get more familiar with it and as you iron things out, then you can expand it as you're comfortable with. Uh, lastly, and this is important, procurement cards, use of them as a privilege. And if somebody misbehaves, you revoke the privilege. Okay? Any questions, comments on procurement cards? 
Okay, this next one is, I think, really important, and I don't think we pay enough attention to it because I don't think we realize how important it is. We need to buy quality, okay? If you buy something that's junk, let's say, for example, you buy a stapler, and um, three months down the road, the, the department that got the stapler ends up with uh, a stapler that doesn't work. Even if it's got a lifetime warranty, there's a good chance that they're going to just pitch it in the garbage and they're going to blame you. Purchasing the car, buying junk, and they're foisting it off on you. Um, we want to buy good quality stuff that people are happy with that will meet or exceed their needs and expectations. Uh, I mentioned the environmental benefit. If you're going through a state for every three months, then probably that's not good for the environment. It's not cost effective either. Public perception is important. Uh, we constantly have people, they assume if we bought something on a competitive bid basis, we ended up with an inferior product. So we need to fight that, and that's, that's an uphill fight. You need to make sure that people at least hopefully don't think that you stay up nights trying to figure out how to make their lives miserable, okay? Um, get them good stuff. And, and, and play devil's advocate. Think about what could go wrong, because chances are it will. When you buy something, think not just, again, I talked about thinking ahead. Don't just think about what you're doing today. But what are you going to be doing six months or a year or two years down the road with some of these products that are going to last that long? Don't get something that likely is going to, you're, you, you're going to outgrow it in six months. Uh, if somebody says they need something that will do X uh, number of copies a month or somebody says they're going to uh, need, need to be able to mow X acres of lawn or whatever, uh, maybe the best thing to do is say, hey, if things change a little bit, what are they going to need to do? And don't get something that will just barely get by. Okay? Um, I've got a, and I'm, I know I'm too old for this, but I've, got, I've still got a motorcycle. I, I just haven't quite completely grown up. Um, and I, uh, the one I've got right now, I bought mostly just because I felt like I, I needed a motorcycle in the garage. Um, I've had probably 40 or 50 of them over the last almost 50 years. And the one I've got right now is, uh, I use it mostly just bombing around the neighborhood and occasionally a ride out to the lake or something like that. But I don't tend to get on the highway with it. I don't tend to go too fast. It'll do 95 miles an hour. Uh, it's, it's what's called a super motard, which is a, a dirt bike with street tires, basically. Uh, anyway, it, It'll do 95 miles an hour, but it's not comfortable doing 95 miles an hour. I would never buy a motorcycle like that if I was going to spend a lot of time on the highway. So if you've got, if you've got a situation where you, you think you're going to spend a lot of time on the highway, make sure it will do, it will handle highway, okay? Try it again. Try it, think ahead of what your requirements are going to be. Um, the last thing on here is a Humpty Dumpty uh, situation. Um, the bigger your organization is, the more difficult time you're going to have to fix a mistake. And I'll give you an example. When I was with Austin Independent School District, we had about 110 schools, and we were we we, we operated a warehouse and we sent supplies out of the warehouse, uh, and uh, we might send pens, pencils, crayons, uh, you know, whatever, any kind of custodial supplies, food service, you know, you name it. Anyway, once in a while we would get a bad product out. Maybe it was toilet paper, or maybe it was uh, pens, or maybe highlighters, or something like that. Well, the problem is, and people don't think about this, they think, well, it's no big deal. If I buy something that's not good, I can always recall it. It is extraordinarily difficult to recall something that has been issued out to a school. About half the time, the, the people in the office are not going to pay any attention to your recall effort. About the other half of the time, they've already issued it to the teacher, and the teacher has probably done one or two things. They've either thrown it in the garbage or they've used it up. Either way, doing a recall is extraordinarily difficult. And the bigger your organization is, the harder it is. 
So the point I'm trying to make is addressing and remedying a problem due to a bad product being out there is a lot more difficult the larger organization is. The best thing to do is avoid getting that product. Okay, so the, the, the front end efforts you can make to avoid those bad products will pay huge dividends. Okay, references. You should require, when you're doing competitive bids or proposals or whatever, you should require comparable references from three to five people typically. And when I say comparable, if you're buying 5,000 something, somebody giving you a reference where they sold one of something to somebody is not a comparable reference. You got me? <coughs> Secondly, don't ask them for 20 references. That's silly. You don't want to check 20 references. If you've got 20 bidders and you've got 20 references, you're going to get tired. Okay? Ask for three to five good references. Check the reference, document the results. And when I say check the references, you want to actually contact them uh, either by phone or by email and write down what you heard, okay? Uh, lastly, make sure you write legibly. A lot of times when you go back to look at references, you can't read the stuff. Maybe you could read it, but maybe you hit the lottery and you're not there to answer questions. Or maybe you moved on to a better position if such a thing could happen. Okay, so make sure that whatever you do in, in this, you document, write legibly. It's just like, it. you know, if you're doing uh, evaluations of uh, proposals, you want to make sure that it's legible because that stuff, not only is it important for you to be able to go back and read it, but it may become important in case of an audit. And most of the people that I've known in purchasing do not write as well as most school teachers. We didn't get, get an A in penmanship. Okay. Staff meetings. Um, these are real important. I, I hear some people say, well, we have staff meetings when we've got an important issue to discuss. And I say, well, how often is that? Well, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe every couple of three months. That's too long. Okay? It's too long. You need to have staff meetings on a regular basis. I think you ought to have them once a week. But your, your circumstances could alter that. Maybe it's better for you, and maybe the most you can do is once a month. But some opportunities that staff meetings present. Number one, you keep team members informed. If you've got a large purchasing operation, let's say you've got six, eight, ten buyers, you don't want to have people calling six eight, ten buyers and get to six, eight, ten different answers. You want people to pretty much speak with one voice. And the bigger you are, the more difficult that can be. Secondly, get to know the team members. You know, a lot of times people don't, you know, maybe they're shy. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to get to know each other. Uh, maybe, you know, 30 minutes, once a week. Good thing. Third, ensure consistent responses. That can't be overemphasized. And I think lastly, um, recognition. People in the public sector, and I don't just mean purchasing, but people in the public sector by and large are not suitably rewarded for exception, exceptional performance. They're just not. Um, there is not a lot of mechanism to get merit raises. How many of you guys work at a place where you can get a merit raise? Anybody? <laughs> hey, I made my point. Okay. One of the things you can do is recognize people for doing a really good job. Give them an attaboy. And people say, well, that doesn't mean anything. It's not money. Well, unless you've got a lot in that wallet, it's, it's probably the best thing you can do. And it means something to people. People really feel good if their uh, efforts are rewarded. And if they, if they get some outstanding results and their, their efforts are recognized, there's a good chance there will be some of that will rub off on some of the other team members who will also want recognition. Um, I worked at a place one time uh, where we didn't pay enough. We, I was at the University of New Mexico. We paid way less than the city of Albuquerque paid. 
We paid way less than Sandia Labs paid, and we paid way less than the tech vendors like Intel and, at that time, D Digital Equipment in, in Albuquerque. So our peers paid a lot more for buyers than we did, in some cases, twice as much. And I was constantly having to recruit and train buyers because of that. And one of the few things I could try to do was reward people for their performance and try to get them to, you know, to be happy in their jobs at maybe at a lower wage than they could have gotten elsewhere. And that's one of the things that you can do, recognize people for superior performance. Okay. Supply agreements. Um, supply agreements are something that you, uh, you'll you set up typically based on your purchases over a preceding period, usually 12 months. You try to make an accurate estimate of what you purchased in the preceding 12 months if you bought it in the past, which usually you have. Uh, and you tell folks, you have a disclaimer, you tell them you're not going to guarantee an annual quantity, but this is an estimate based on prior year purchases. Okay? The supply agreement may be renewable. You know, it might be a, a one year with an, an option for a second year or maybe even longer than that. Uh, it might be shorter. Uh, if it's a volatile product, let's say for example paper, maybe paper prices are not stable enough to where the supplier is comfortable giving you a 12 month commitment without padding their price, then you might want to go with say six months or even four. Uh, the supply agreement should be revisited carefully as the end approaches. And what I'm talking about that, let's say for example you said you were going to buy a thousand of something and you get towards the end of the supply agreement, go back and see, have you been buying that many? Sometimes you'll find you've been buying a lot more than your estimate. In which case when you do a new supply agreement you need to raise that estimate up. Sometimes you'll find out you haven't been buying near as many as you thought you would, so you want to lower it. And people say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you've been buying a lot more, you need to let the vendors know because that will give them an incentive to sharpen their pencils and give you better prices. If you've been buying a lot less, then that, that puts the vendor in a position where he's, been, he's giving you a lower price than he should based on the quantity. So make sure that you don't just change the dates and get new bids, okay? Actually, take a look and see what you've been buying. Uh, Lastly, there should be some sort of an extension clause to avoid the contract lapse. You know, sometimes in public purchasing, it takes us longer to award a contract than we thought it would. Maybe it takes longer to evaluate, maybe it takes longer to get board approval, whatever. So have a contract clause that says, you know, you reserve the right, the unilateral right, to extend the contract for 30 or 60 or maybe even 90 days uh, to avoid a contract lapse, okay? Any questions on supply rooms? Uh, you should have an up-to-date website. You know, uh, I'm not very tech savvy, to put it mildly. Uh, my son tells me, just a hair above computer illiterate. Uh, but I really do. I, I feel for people, you know, a lot of people think, well, gee, I'll get a website that'll make me high tech. Well, the only thing worse the no website at all is a website that's way out of date. So if you're going to have one, visit it yourself or have somebody in your organization who's assigned the responsibility to make sure it's up to date. And they ought to be visiting it at least once a month. Okay. Some important things to include on that website for purchasing. First one is contact information for staff by commodities. If John buys uh, instructional supplies, John's contact information ought to be there with instructional supplies. Um, office hours and holidays. You know, that seems like it's so simple, but the truth of the matter is we're different. In public sector, particularly K-12, from most entities, we have different hours. We have different holidays. Most of y'all get a week or two weeks at Christmas and a week at spring break. Some of y'all get Fridays off during the summer. And people say, well, you know, we, we, we know that. We've been doing that a long time. Well, to most vendors, unless they do primarily K-12, to that's not the norm. So they, they need to be able to know that during the summer, they shouldn't be calling you on Friday because you're at the lake. 
Okay. Bitter enrollment. If you maintain a bid list, and you're not legally required to do so, but if you maintain a bidder's list for various services and commodities, the process for enrolling on that bidder's list should be addressed to the website. These are key things. There's lots more good stuff. You can tell them about up upcoming contracting opportunities. You can tell them about what you know bid tabs or abstracts for previous purchases, who suppliers are, all kinds of good stuff. But these are some just real key things. Any questions, comments? No. Okay. Uh, written quotes. I, I still hear people occasionally telling me that they're going to get phone quotes for something. You shouldn't be getting phone quotes for anything. Okay? And I'm not saying you disconnect your phone, but um, it, it, when you get a phone quote, there's, there's all kinds of bad things that can happen. The, the supplier misunderstood what you asked, or you misunderstood what he said. The benefit of the written quote, you requested in writing, so there's written evidence of what you requested, i.e. the specifications. And the response is writing, so there's a written evidence of what was responded. Okay? That's real important. Don't get phone quotes. If you feel like you've absolutely positively got to get a phone quote on something because the sheer urgency, make sure to follow it up. And by that I mean get some, get a written confirmation. Acknowledgements. How many of you guys at least once in a while use acknowledgements? Some of you? I have heard people on a very theoretical basis tell me you should get an acknowledgement for every purchase. Personally, I think that's way too much effort for way too little benefit, and you're never going to get 100% compliance. But having said that, if you've got critical items, let's say, for example, you need 400 uh, computers for the start of school, and they need to be available by August 1st, you need to make sure that the vendor who's going to supply those has acknowledged that they're going to do it, and when they're going to do it, and you've got something in writing. Guarantee you, if you're doing a lot of purchases, there's going to be times, whether it's due to the mail, whether it's due to an equipment malfunction or whatever, or whether it's due to just flat dishonesty or incompetence on the part of the vendor, where all of a sudden you realize the, this critical thing that you needed for a critical activity is not there, and the vendor says, I never got your order. So what I'm saying is, these are used primarily for non-routine purchases. Might be furniture for a new school, might be computers that I mentioned, maybe, uh, maybe it's books for a new school. It could be a lot of different things, but critical non-routine purchases. It needs to merit the extra effort for the buyer himself, because it's gonna, it's gonna take more effort on your part to ask them to acknowledge it and to stay after it and make sure they do send you an acknowledgement. The acknowledgement copy is usually a copy of the printed purchase order and they send it back to you and they acknowledge receipt and acceptance of your order and the date or dates by which delivery will occur. And again, if you're issuing, say, 10,000 purchase orders a year, you don't want to go to that kind of effort on, on every purchase order. But you might have a hundred, or maybe even a couple hundred, depending on your size, that are critical. And on those, you should require an acknowledgement. There are a few vendors that will give it to you automatically, but most vendors don't. You are probably going to have to ask for it. Okay? Standardization. Um, this is something, I think, where we probably don't do as good a job as we should. Uh, we tend to be very democratic. We tend, if we have 100 schools, we've got 100 principals, so we've got 100 kingdoms. Um, but I'm going to say that standardization can result in lower prices, faster delivery, and it can conserve space. And those are three very worthwhile, uh, how do you say, goals. <coughs> lower prices, because if you're buying Let's say, for example, chairs, and you're buying 10,000 of the same chair, you're going to get a better price than if you're buying 30 different models of a chair and you're buying 300 of each. 
Everybody with me on that? Okay. Faster delivery. My circumstance, when I got to Austin Independent School District in 1985, I would have, at the start of school, I would have principals. They would send me a written, at that time, paper request uh, asking for 15 green 16-inch plastic stack chairs. You know, we got a lot of support surplus in the warehouse, and that's a lot of why we have it, to make sure we can uh, react to these kinds of requests. It's a dynamic urban district. A lot of moving back and forth. School's getting bigger, school's getting smaller. I go to the warehouse and I find out, yeah, we got lots of 16-inch stack chairs, but we don't have 15 green ones in 16-inch. Next day, I get a request. Somebody wants 25 yellow 18-inch stack chairs. I find we don't have that many of that color either. We got six orange ones, we got 12 green ones, we got 15 blue ones, and so on and so forth. Long and the short of it was, <clears throat> in order to get what they really wanted, we had to do a new order at the worst time in the world. You know, the hardest time in the world to get performance promptly from a vendor is the start of school. So we provided lousy service. And I got tired of getting beat up over it. So we standardized on blue plastic stack chairs. You could get 12 inch, 14 inch, 16 inch, 18 inch, and you could get any color you wanted as long as it was blue. <laughs> and I had a lot of people beat me up over that. You know, how I was ruining the educational, the, the ambiance of the school, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I said, hey, you buy the, the navy blue plastic stack chair, I can get you delivery within 48 hours. Okay, that's why we've got this requirement. And I, fortunately, I got buy-in from the top. You've got to have buy-in from the top when you infringe on people's democratic prerogatives, particularly if it involves their decorating tests. Okay, the point of the matter is, we were able to stock a couple of hundred of the various sizes. They were all navy blue with a chrome frame. And pretty soon, I didn't have that problem. When I got requests from people, you know, it's worked through the system. When I got requests from people for chairs, they didn't even say what color. Or if they said what color, they said blue, because that's what they were replacing. But I had it was, it was very difficult to do, because I had people say, you know, I've got 27 green chairs in this classroom, and you're going to send me three blue ones. How's John and Jane and Sue going to feel if they end up in the wrong colors? The point I'm making is we can provide better service, better prices, faster delivery, and we can conserve space by having standardization. That's just one example, but it was a good example. Uh, it worked really well for us, and uh, I, I, I encourage you to, to do that. Uh, I'm done with my formal presentation. If y'all have any questions, I'd be more than pleased to try to answer them. Uh, anybody? Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. Sorry. Yeah, I was writing. I was, I was writing my notes back there, so I was like, okay, let me uh, let me see what I need to uh, say up here. Um, yeah, well, uh, it's part of my uh, recycling. <laughs> Later on, I will use it. Uh, 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 is everybody uh, received my emails? Uh, uh, I know that uh, a couple of you have uh, we've sent uh, some notices on uh, on some recruitments. Uh, is Paul Young here? Um, not here. Okay, they uh, they've asked me to send a few of their advertisements for for uh, positions. I know at ACD we have a couple of them that that are coming up, so I'll probably be sending those uh, uh, this week uh, as well, so just look out for those. Uh, um, so anyway, the, we'll go ahead and uh, continue. Uh, we're in a little bit behind, we'll adjust as, as we move along, and we we'll need to uh, uh, make, some, make some adjustments. So uh, Sarah's been again uh, with, uh, with us uh, before, so it's no stranger to you, so um, thank you for being here, and so please help me welcome Sarah Ledward. 
Thank y'all very much. As Jesus said, um, I'm Sarah Lingua. I'm a partner with Rogers Morris and Grover here in Houston, and we practice school law. We represent many of you here, um, so it's great to see some familiar faces in the room. And since you're all sitting here, I'm guessing you all had a great first week of school because otherwise, if you had one of those issues like the previous pre presenter said about, you know, computers didn't arrive, textbooks didn't arrive, my guess is that you wouldn't be sitting in a training today. Um, so congratulations on a great first week of school. We're going to talk today about um, public works and maintenance and construction and what the legal definitions of those um, categories are and what impact they have based on which category you fall into. We're not going to go into the procurement requirements of maintenance versus construction today um, because quite frankly there's just not enough time. Um, but if you want to hear more about the procurement obligations with maintenance and construction of public works, um, Jim Owens and I have submitted a topic on that to present at the TASB's Maintenance and Operations Conference later um, that's right. Um, be in Frisco. In Frisco, and I can't remember the uh, date. I don't remember the date. November, maybe? Something like Whenever that conference is, um, hopefully our school will be, will be selected to speak. And so if you wanted to learn more about the specific procurement requirements for maintenance and operations um, and cons facilities constructions, construction, come and hear Jim and I speak on that. So today, um, maintenance of public works, what we're going to talk about a uh, brief introdu introduction, then we're going to go into the definition of maintenance, definition of public works, um, and then the prevailing wage payment bond and performance bond requirements if you do determine that your particular project falls within a, the category of public works, which does require um, prevailing wage payment bond and performance bonds. <coughs> so, brief introduction. Um, as you may know, the Texas Education Code does not include a definition for the term construction. Um, they talk a lot about construction, and specifically now they, were, they kick you over to 2269 of the government code for procurement of construction, but they don't have a definition of what constitutes construction. Um, as a general proposition, construction contracts can encompass both maintenance and public works contracts. So the broad category of construction encompasses both of those categories. It's important to distinguish between maintenance and true maintenance in a public work contract for a few reasons. Primarily because if it's a public work contract, prevailing wage rates have to be applied. For true maintenance, you don't have to pay prevailing wage. Similarly, for a public work contract, you have to get a payment bond if it's more than $25,000 and a performance bond if it's more than $100,000. For maintenance, those requirements don't exist. And also, the procurement is different um, for those two categories. So first, with regards to maintenance, what does maintenance mean? Well, similarly, the Texas Education Code doesn't include a definition of maintenance either. Um, and so we have to look to AG opinions, to OSHA definitions, to court cases, et cetera, in order to determine what constitutes maintenance, true maintenance. According to the AG, the AG says, and this is from an opinion way back in 1930, but it's still good law and it's still cited all the time, uh, with, with regards to the definition of maintenance. Maintenance includes ordinary upkeep, repairs that are necessary to preserve something in good condition, to keep up, keep from change, or to preserve. It includes ordinary repairs that are necessary and proper from time to time for that purpose alone. What does the administrative code say? Um, well, they do have a definition of maintenance in the administrative code. And the, it provides that maintenance includes all replacements or repairs, and they have to be of the same rating, type, or grade as the existing installation. This for that. No upgrades allowed. No, including no upgraded part, appurtenance, or material. Has to, if you're taking out a light bulb, it's got to be the same type of light bulb that goes back in. <coughs> maintenance is further defined under the administrative code to, to include scheduled periodic work that's necessary to sustain or support safe, efficient, and continuous operations, or to prevent the decline, failure, lapse, or deterioration of the improvement, to keep it in its existing state. That's considered to be maintenance. Importantly, maintenance does not include 
remodeling work, modifying uh, a, a particular facility, any upgrade. And to me, that's the biggest distinction between maintenance and construction, or maintenance versus public works when it comes to a facility, is that if you are upgrading at all, that doesn't fall within the definition of maintenance. Um, also, performing major repairs is not necessarily uh, maintenance. Or to restore, even if the work is scheduled or periodic. Just because it's on your schedule for, for quote unquote routine maintenance and because you categorize it as maintenance, you really need to look at the specific project to determine is this truly maintenance? Are we upgrading in some way? Are we modifying this in some way? Because you may cross the line into the definition of public work. OSHA standards are perhaps the most stringent in terms of categorizing maintenance versus public work. According to OSHA, maintenance activities are making or keeping a structure, fixture, or foundation in proper condition in a routine, scheduled, or anticipated fashion. This definition implies keeping equipment working in its existing state, i.e. preventing its failure or decline. There's an incredibly detailed OSHA decision. You know, you can go on OSHA's website and search uh, the, the rulings and the opinions by date. It's August 11th of 1994, and the, the uh, topic is construction versus maintenance. It offers a really good explanation of the legal difference between construction and maintenance. And importantly, OSHA relies on the same definitions of maintenance and construction that the Department of Labor uses in determining prevailing wage rates under Davis-Bacon. And I had the decision, and I was going to read a few things from it now, I don't know where I'm, oh, there it is. Um, and I hate to read to you, but this is, I thought these um, provisions were really important. So, as I just mentioned, OSHA's regulations make specific references to the definitions in Davis-Bacon, and the Davis-Bacon Act regulations that are issued by the DOL broadly define uh, construction, work, or, or activity. Importantly, the decision says that construction work is not limited to new construction, and there's no specific definition for maintenance, nor a clear distinction between terms such as <coughs> maintenance, repair, or refurbishment. Maintenance activities can be defined as making or keeping a structure, fixture, or foundation in proper condition in a routine, scheduled, or anticipated fashion, in its exist keeping it in its existing state. However, this definition is not dispositive, says OSHA, and consequently determinations of whether a contractor is engaged in maintenance operations rather than construction activities must be made on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account all information available at a particular site. We have in some instances where an activity cannot be easily classified as construction or maintenance, even when measured against all of the relevant factors, according to OSHA, you should move that, if it's, um, if it's a sort of in that gray area, you should apply the more stringent um, standards, so to classify and allow application of the more protective statutes. And the more protective statutes, of course, are gonna be those that are for, for, um, for public works. So just, that's the, the guidance that we received from OSHA. And again, that decision is August 11th, 1994. As a general proposition, the replacement of a piece of equipment or components of equipment or components that are, that are equal in grade, quality, and capacity is considered maintenance without the addition of any new or upgraded components or appurtenances. That will not be considered to be a public work and can be con considered to be a strictly a maintenance project. Again, routine maintenance doesn't cross the line into a public work contract. And why is that important? Well, if it's strictly maintenance, Chapter 2254-53 regarding performance and payment bonds, this, they don't apply to maintenance contracts. And similarly, Chapter 2258 regarding prevailing wage rates don't apply to maintenance contracts either. <clears throat> so moving on to public works. What's a public work? Well, Similarly, you're going to see a theme here with a lack of definitions in statute. Public work is not defined in statute. What is defined is a public work contract. And a public work contract is included in 20, Chapter 2253 of the Government Code. And it provides that a public work contract is defined as 
a contract for constructing, altering, or repairing a public building. That's the key part, a public building, or carrying out or completing any public work. Case law has clarified that a public work contract doesn't include all contracts that are entered into by governmental entities like school districts, but they're limited to, of course, traditional construction projects um, involving the development or the significant repair of a public building. Public works labor is defined as labor used directly to carry out a public work. Well, thanks a lot for that definition. That's very helpful. Thank you, legislature. Um, so, oh, sorry, I forgot to uh, flip past that one. Texas courts, because this has been litigated frequently in Texas courts, because the definitions in some instances are incredibly broad, and then that last instance of public work labor are just completely unhelpful. Um, and so, this, because this has been litigated a lot, we have some clear-cut rules about what constitutes public work. So Texas courts have expressly found that the definition of public works includes a contract to do the following things. To reconstruct a portion of a street. You're ripping up the street, you're ripping up, you know, laying down the asphalt, etc. Courts have said that's considered a public work. That's not just maintenance, that's public work. Remodeling a building, some sort of significant remodeling. You're tearing down walls, um, you're putting up new walls, you're putting in new electrical outlets, you're you know, maybe doing pump plumbing work, things like that. Remodeling an existing facility, that's considered to be a public work. Of course, building an elementary school, um, I don't remember off the top of my head what that case was specifically about, but I thought, you have to litigate whether or not building an entirely new elementary school is considered public work or not. I think that was pretty clear cut, but apparently it wasn't. Um, to make an addition and renovations to a school district building, and again, the, the key part here is it's determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you're making a significant addition, that's likely going to be, you know, you're adding four classrooms, you're adding a new gym, et cetera. That's going to be considered to be a public work, and you're going to have to pay prevailing wages and likely get performance and payment bonds. Courts have also found that constructing a water supply system and treatment plant is considered to be a public work. For air conditioning of a county courthouse where the central system air conditioners and window units were to be installed in the courthouse as fixtures or improvements of a fixed nature. Now that one I could see why that was litigated. Because if you're, I mean this was a, obviously an older case that talked about window units. Um, but is the window unit, is that, and that was, the court found that was considered construction. Even though it's, you know, pretty easily removable, the court found no, that was a fixture and an improvement of such a nature that that was considered a public work contract and not maintenance. Um, also to construct a new roadway and parking lot. Um, if you're gonna add in expanding parking lots, et cetera, that's likely gonna be a public work. You're doing something new. Um, that, that's not just maintenance. Courts have also ruled on what's not considered to be a public work. Um, a contract between a state university and a prime contractor for the removal and disposal of contaminated water and residue in a pond, that was highly, that was litigated, um, and the court found that that was not a public work. Why? Why do you think that wasn't a public work? It's not a building, first of all. Um, and is it, well, is it maintenance? If it's not a building, if it's not a public work, is it maintenance? See why these things are hard? <laughs> well, the court found that the work of the contractor in this instance to clean up the pond was the performance of a service. Um, it was neither construction, um, which is you know, no installation of fixtures or anything like that, and it wasn't maintenance. It was just, it was a service. Um, so that's an interesting one. Also, what was not considered to be a public work contract to develop and implement a records retention schedule, a disaster recovery plan, and a storage solution for old records. Now in this one, the court, this all centered around the quote unquote installation of file cabinets. Um, yeah, so was that, you know, and because they were very large, uh, they were being affixed either to the floor and or to the wall, um, and they, you know, like the, 
with the um, window units, you know, with window units, that was considered construction. For these file cabinets, even though they were quote unquote installed, the court found that the file cabinets that were installed pursuant to the contract were not used for construction or repair of a public building. Like Derek said earlier, you know, it's not a building. They weren't used for the public building because they weren't fixtures or improvements to a public building. The court said, you could easily remove these things. Even though they were quote unquote affixed, you could, they could be easily removed and therefore they were not, this was not considered to be a public work contract. Um, but you can see why we grapple with these things as lawyers and you guys grapple with them as um, procurement people because you know, I would have used that same reasoning for the window units personally, but the court found two, found, you know, very two different results with the window units versus uh, the file cabinets. So, also what was not a public work, uh, a public work contract was, did not exist between a contractor and with a county to prepare and deliver a map, flat book system, and delinquent tax list. There I have questions. Of course. If something is bolted to a building, doesn't that become part of that building? Well, and that's the distinction. I mean, that's one of those things that where you have to, you know, in that last case with the file cabinets, the court said, even though they were quote unquote affixed, that they were could easily be removed. So they weren't considered true fixtures or installations to the building. Um, but, you know, it depends, to me it depends on what's being bolted to the building, how permanent is it. If you're cementing something in, right. I mean, you know, that's not gonna be considered to be easily removable. Um, but if you're just screwing something to a wall or, you know, with some brackets, holding it up, Maybe that is easy, you know, that's probably more easily removable. Yes, I understand what she's talking about because you have some uh, filing systems that are actually tracked and right. embedded into doors, right? And you don't just come in and say, I'm taking the screw out. Right. So that may rise to the level of being a public work. I mean, but it really is dependent upon, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of how big is the project? How much money are you spending? Okay. Um, you know, are you truly improving that pu the, a public building <coughs> and making an appurtenance to a public building? That may, you may be the case. You have a, you know, a room this size and you're installing those things and it's, I mean, a true installation of something that may rise to the level. I have a comment. Sure. Now I learned it from Jim Owens because he was in construction. Part of the definition you should consider a uh, certificate of occupancy there are certain things that have to be in the building before you let people in the building. Fog cabinets are kind of like air conditioning right. in Texas. You have to have air conditioning, you have to have electricity, plumbing. So that's I've always used that as a guide for public work versus not. Uh, yeah, that's why the air conditioning is in Texas. That's important if you're up in the north. It may not be. It may be a different public work up there. Very true. Did everybody hear what Derek had to say about that? About, you know, a good tool to use. Um, when evaluating whether something is maintenance or it's a public work is what is needed for the certificate of occupancy. If it's needed for the certificate of occupancy, then it's likely going to be considered to be a public work and true construction as opposed to just maintenance. So that's a really good point. Thanks. So as we've been saying over and over, um, you know, it really is a case by case basis and whether a particular contract is a public work contract depends upon whether the contract really calls for a substantial change to a public work or to a public building. That's where you, know, you really have to look at the scope of the project. If the work includes the addition of any new or upgraded components to a public building, it's likely going to fall in that category of public work. If you're putting in something brand new, your life's likely crossed the line into a public work. Unless you're just putting in something um, just to, for pure repair, you know, to keep an existing HVAC system working, you're going to replace um, a certain part of that, of, of the system. Well, it's a new part, but remember the definition of maintenance also includes keeping something in working order. That's, that's going to be maintenance. Um, so don't look at it just in terms of, oh my gosh, this is new. Sarah said anything new goes into public work. <coughs> it's not that simple. It's not that, uh, that bright line of a rule. So for example, um, painting, as a general proposition, that's a, for, for lawyers, that's usually an, an easy one in terms of, um, you're just repainting a wall, yes, that's just maintenance, no problem. The AG has said though that 
repainting a previously constructed facility. So if we were going to repaint this wall, that's considered maintenance. But if you're painting a newly constructed structure, then that's considered a public work. Um, so even something as simple as painting, you really have to take it to the next step and ask the additional question of, are we painting something for the first time, brand new, that's never been painted before, it's a new building, which in that case it would be considered to be a public work, or are we repainting, then that's considered to be maintenance. That's a great question. Um, her question was, does the value of a con the contract ever enter in? Not for the initial question of, is this a public work versus maintenance? No. Because um, you could have, uh, we'll get to it in a second, for example, the installation of a single new electrical outlet. That's not going to cost you very much, right? Just one new, installing one new outlet. It's installing one new outlet, is that maintenance or is that a public work? That's a public work. Um, and so, you know, that pure first question of is this maintenance or public work, that there is no bright line rule as far as the dollar amount is concerned. Um, but in some instances, you know, if it's that substantial change, you may be able to take into account the dollar amount. But in other instances, like, the, the, by example, with the installation of the single outlet, the dollar amount's not going to matter. The dollar amount does matter with regard to bonds, though, and we'll get to that in a second. Well, I just gave you the answers to one of my to one of these tests, um, <laughs> so that should be an easy one. But let's go through some of these. These are some that you know I think are a little harder, but for some of you who've been doing this for decades and decades, um, you'll likely get these right off the spot. So, what about relocating portable buildings? Ding 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 ding. Thomas got it right. Um, it's neither maintenance nor is it a public work. That's just considered to be a service. It's for relocating the portable buildings. Well, now you've relocated the portable buildings to you know, your other campus or other location, wherever they're moving. And of course, you need to hook up electricity to these buildings. Connecting electricity to portable buildings. Is that maintenance or is that a public work? Public work. Very good. Awesome. Um, removing a wall in a portable building. Does anyone disagree? Who can argue one way or the other? Those of you who said public work, why do you think it's a public work? Well, because you're actually going into a facility or a building and you move a wall, which is which making a change to that building. Not necessarily adding to it, but it's still going to change it move from this workspace to more space. So it's actually changing the dynamics of that, room, of that building. Anybody disagree? Yes, it's maintenance because it's an existing wall. Is it maintenance because it's an existing wall? I think that's the difference. So I think with you know removing a wall in a portable building, I think you have to ask more. You know, if your your maintenance person or your construction person calls you and says, "Hey, I don't know whether or not to tell my contractor that prevailing wage is required or not. We're all, we're removing a public a, we're removing a building and a port a wall in a portable building." You have to go a step further and say, well, are you putting up a new wall? Or are you doing, you know, are you fixing, are you installing flooring, are you doing um, that sort of stuff? You know, if you're putting up a new wall, you know, that's involving, you know, you're doing drywall, you're redoing the electrical, you're all that kind of stuff. I think that's a public work. If you're merely tearing down a wall just to make a room bigger, um, you know, typically demolition work is not considered to be a public work. Um, so for that one, you have to ask some more questions because it could be, it could fall into either category depending on what you're doing after you rip the wall out. You know, or you, or you have to do repairing electrical work, putting in new electrical, or are you putting in new drywall, are you putting up a new wall? To me, that falls within a public work, but it's not a bright line rule. So what about uh, the next one? Um, I sort of gave you the answer. Uh, <laughs> demolition work. What about demolition work? That's usually a service. It's neither maintenance nor is it a public work. Pure demolition work, um, typically, is just a service. What about hydrostatic testing on a boiler? This one I don't seem very confident of. Sorry. <laughs> yes, that's a service. Testing 
is typically falls into the category of a service as opposed to, uh, to, to maintenance. Even if you're doing it on a routine ba ba basis, um, it's still considered to be a service. Installation of playground equipment. That was very definitive. <laughs> I, like, I like definitive. Barbara, you agree? It's calling you out. Playground equipment. Mm -hmm. It's a service to me. Barbara thinks it's a service. I feel like y'all should get up and come. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. you look quite strong, but yeah, I'm going to go with Barbara. Barbara's a tough lady. Yeah, that's my group. <laughs> oh, y'all could disagree. That's even better. Um, playground equipment is really a gray area. Um, you know, it sort of depends because for playground equipment, or does it involve a facility? Does it involve a public work? Does it involve a public building? Um, however, you know, if you're installing a very typical, you know, climb up, slide, a swing, you know, not a whole lot of money, and this is a this is an instance where the dollar amount I think does come into play, um, even though that's not a, there's no bright line dollar amount rule. But I think with playground equipment, you need to look at the scope of the project, and you need to look at um, and how much it is. So for playground equipment, you know, even though it's in this gray area, if it's more than twenty-five thousand dollars, I'm going to tell you, get a get a payment box. Okay, but on that note, Sarah, I mean, aren't there certain specifications that you have to have and guidelines that you have? Absolutely. To so with those not because this is not something that you're maintaining, you actually doing an installation which requires certain guidelines. So should that not fall under the public work? Well, and that's why I think if you in this instance you do look to the dollar. So if you're installing some major playground. I mean, some giant structure. Um, then, and if it's more than 25 grand, I think, yeah, you get a payment bond, and then I think it is moving toward that category. Um, but if you're just installing some small, you know, little, uh, for, you know, kindergarten to underage, you know, under. But even for fall zone, I mean, is that a requirement that we have to have? You still have to have all those requirements right. for playground equipment, et cetera, but the, the pure existence of those requirements, I don't think is outcome determined. If that makes sense. Um, but again, this is where I would look at the dollar amount, the scope of the project. How big are we talking about um, of playground equipment? Yes, ma'am. She's trying to get you to talk about yes and no. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara, for, for calling me out. I appreciate it. You can always She's trying to get you to do that, but what you're telling us is great. It depends on the scope of work. It does. She and I had a major install job at every elementary school. Playground equipment falls on, etc. Mm -hmm. So I learned something. Specifically addresses electrical maintenance work, and it says 
Electrical maintenance work constitutes the replacement or repair of existing electrical appurtenances, apparatus, equipment, machinery, or controls used in connection with the use of electrical energy in, on, outside, or attached to a building, residence, structure, property, or premises. All replacements or repairs must be of the same rating and type as the existing installation. So electrical maintenance work is incredibly narrow. Um, and that's included, if you ever need to look at that, it's included in uh, chapter 16 of the Texas Administrative Code, uh, or 16, TAC, chapter 73, section 7310. Can I ask a question? Sure, absolutely. I, I looked down for a moment and we had passed demolition. Okay. I got demolition of a wall, if that's all, you're not putting the carpet back, you know, you're not putting anything. It could be like it could be maintenance. It could be a public work. Okay. Um, depending on the, on the scope. Let's say you're demolishing a something. That's a service. Oh, you're demolishing yes. an existing building okay. to build to make way. You're going to build a new elementary school. That's a service. That's a service. Um, okay. Usually, that's a service. Yeah. So, what's a good rule of thumb? Well, as a general proposition. If a construction contract doesn't fall within that limited definition of maintenance, it's really safe to consider it a public work and to apply the rules that apply to public works. Um, for the past 75 years, the Attorney General has defined maintenance as work required to keep a building in its current condition and to prevent decay. So if you're doing something other than that, then you're likely going to move into the realm of a public work. But again, I can't overemphasize enough how fact intensive and case by case specific these determinations are and how they should be made. So let's say you have now considered your project and you say, yep, we're clearly square within a public work, um, or even if we're not squarely within the definition of a public work, it's, such, it's on the line, so we're going to consider it to be a public work. Well, in that case, prevailing wage rates apply. Many of you likely are aware, Chapter 2258 um, applies to the construction of a public work, including a building, highway, road, excavation, and repair work, or other project development or improvement paid for in whole or in part from public funds. Well, we're likely going to be using public funds. Um, but note that it is that two-prong test. For it has, to, in order for prevailing wage rates to apply, it has to be cons for construction of a public work and it has to be paid for, at least in part, by public funds. Well, the second problem we're very likely going to easily meet. The prevailing wage requirement does not apply to true maintenance work. The right to be paid prevailing wages um, is included in 2258. It provides for a worker who is employed on a public work by or on behalf of the state or political subdivision. In the school districts, we all know that we're political subdivisions have to be paid not less than the general prevailing rate or per diem wages for work of a similar character in the locality in which the work is performed, and not less than the general prevailing rate of per diem wages for legal holidays and overtime. Note that the statute doesn't prevent workers from being paid more, um, but we all know that contractors, you know, prevailing wage is what is the highest that they're usually going to pay. The public body, for purposes of 2258, public body means a public body awarding a contract for a public work on behalf of the state or political subdivision of the state. So when you, when you see it, the terms public body and the prevailing wage rate statutes, just know that means you guys as school districts. Um, the public body has to determine the general prevailing rate of per diem wages in the locality in which the work is performed for each craft or type of worker and the prevailing wage rate for the legal holiday and overtime work by one of two mechanisms. There's only two. One, conducting a very expensive survey of wages received by classes of workers employed on projects of a character similar to the contract work in the political subdivision of the state in which the public work is being performed. So, or using Davis Bacon, using the prevailing wage rate that's determined by the by DOL at the Department of Labor. Does that mean that you can just adopt some prevailing wage rate? No, we, we're going to just, you know, here's what we think prevailing wage rate should be. No, the only way that, the only two choices the school district has with regard to determining prevailing wage rate 
is to conduct a survey or enter into an interlocal agreement with another governmental entity who's conducting a survey, and that's very typical. Or using Davis-Bacon. And Davis-Bacon is a general proposition that several ones are higher than what your local one, at least here in Houston, would be. Um, and so the survey option is a good one if you can either you know, have the funds to do your own survey or if you can enter into an interlocal agreement with another governmental entity who's either doing a survey or has already done the survey. And then you can use their for family wage rates. What if an architect has done one? Can you use what they give you? As long as they meet the requirements of the, the, the survey requirements. Yes. And then the rights need to be approved by the board. I think if you're doing, I do think that the board should approve the rates. And usually it's going to be a CD local. If you pull your CD local policy, it should, most of them should say something about what determination has been made by the district in terms of prevailing wage rate, whether you're going to have done a survey or enter into a middle of a group with another agency who's done a survey, or if you're going to specify um, that you're using DOL's wages. That's my recommendation, is that it be done by the CD local by the board. Okay. As you hopefully know, a public body must specify in the procurement documents and in the contract itself what the rate, wage rates are um, in terms of your specific school district. And your determination of the general prevailing wage rate of per diem wages is final. The obligation is actually on the contractor and on the subcontractor who are awarded public work contracts to pay no less than the rate that your school district has determined for a prevailing wage rate. And as our overachiever mentioned earlier, what happens if you make this wrong call, if you say something is maintenance as opposed to a public work, that ends up in litigation, and the court determines, nope, this is really a public work, then you realize, oops, we didn't require that the contractor pay prevailing wage, what happens? The contract, a contractor or a sub who violates the prevailing wage payment requirements has to pay the public body on behalf of the, of the contract, for the contract was made $60, for each worker employed for each calendar day, or part of the day, that the worker was paid less than prevailing wage rates. That can add up really quickly, 60 bucks per worker per day. But a contractor or sub does not violate the requirement if you as the school district who was awarded the contract does not determine the prevailing wage rates and doesn't specify those rates in the contract as required by the chapter. So what do I generally recommend? I say if you're, if, if you're not sure whether it's maintenance or construction or for sure for construction, um, you include it in your bid documents. I mean, what big title, prevailing wage rates, and you de detail the requirements of 2258. You say in there whatever the rules are for that your school district has to determine what the prevailing wage rate is, whether that's through a, through a survey or if you're using DOL's rates. Just include it and make sure you include it in your procurement documents. An officer, agent, or representative of the state or political subdivision or school districts commits an offense if he or she willfully violates or does not comply with the prevailing wage, wage rate statute. Punishment is a fine not to exceed $500, confinement in jail for a term not to exceed six months, or both a fine and confinement in prison. Now, am I suggesting that you spend a great amount of your resources um, and administrative time monitoring prevailing wage rates, wage rates, for example, for installing a one electrical outlet? No, I mean, I think that would be silly. I mean, you just, you have too much to do in a day. Um, you know, the penalty for non-compliance is $60 per worker per day. And so you just need to take that into consideration when you're making the determination, is this maintenance or is this a public work? You have to look at the risk um, and say, do we get over gonna, are we gonna not hard on our contractors and make sure that they're paying the prevailing wage rate, or we're just going to include it in the contract, and if they do it, great, and if not, well, then they, or they have to pay that $60 a day, a day. You really just need to look, at, again, at the scope and determine whether or not this is something you really want to spend administrative time evaluating of whether or not your contractors are actually paying the prevailing wage. And again, you know, installing a single electrical outlet, would I say that you, you know, make sure that they're paying the prevailing wage rate? required, yes. 
it's just a judgment call for you to make in terms of how much time you want to spend just deciding that. Um, my main point today, you know, is for you guys is a this is a critical question of whether or not something is maintenance in, in a public work. But also, just because something is coming out of the maintenance department, a contract is coming out of that department, or it's coming out of the maintenance fund, is not outcome determinative. That does, just because it's coming from one of those two places doesn't mean, oh, this isn't construction, this isn't a public work, we don't have to get a, a payment bond or a performance bond, we don't, have to, you know, we don't have to worry about prevailing wage rates. Not necessarily. You really need to take a closer look and determine whether or not it's maintenance or it's a public work. Um, and importantly, your contract should attempt to pass on the penalty um, to your contractor, um, you know, shift that risk to the contractor just in your procurement document, in your standard terms of conditions, in terms of prevailing wage rate. All right, any questions about prevailing wage rate before we move on to bonds? I have five minutes. Okay, good, no questions. So with regards to payment and performance bonds, a governmental entity that makes a public work contract with a prime contractor has to require the contractor to provide a performance bond if the contract is in excess of $100,000 and a payment bond in the amount of the contract if the contract is in excess of $25,000 and the governmental entity is not in this county. Well, none of y'all in this county, so you don't have to worry about that. So first, with payment bonds, as I just said, it's required for public work contracts, not maintenance, public work contracts, in excess of $25,000. It has to be executed in the amount of the contract. And importantly, the statute, uh, which is 2253, explicitly provides that the payment bond is solely for the protection and use of payment bond beneficiaries who have a direct contractual relationship with a prime contractor or sub to supply work, labor, or materials. Solely for those individuals' protections, but it's not for the school district's protection. But, if a governmental entity fails to obtain a payment bond from a prime contractor, then what happens? We stand in the shoes as a surety. Um, the governmental entity is subject to the same liability that a surety would be um, if the surety had obtained a payment bond and the entity had obtained a payment bond. And the bond beneficiaries are entitled to li a lien on the money due to the prime contractor in the same manner as if the public work contract was subject to uh, the, the laws and rules related to liens on money due to public work contractors. Um, and so you see, particularly with payment bonds, why it's so important to make that determination with regard to maintenance versus public works is if you don't require a payment bond, you can eat as you all know, you easily can cross that $25,000 threshold, <coughs> then y'all, then the school district becomes, the saves in the shoes of the, of the surety. That makes me nervous. So for payment performance bonds, um, we all know that a performance bonds are required for public works contracts in excess of $100,000. And these bonds are solely for the protection of the governmental entity. Unlike payment bonds, performance bonds are solely for school districts' protections. It's conditioned on the faithful performance of the work in accordance with the specs and plans and the contract documents. Okay. In conclusion, distinguishing between projects that are strictly maintenance and projects that involve a public works contract is a very critical step, and as I said, don't, don't think, oh, this is coming from the maintenance department, or this is coming, you know, it's being paid for out of the maintenance department's budget, budgeted funds. That's not outcome determinative. You really need to take an extra look, particularly at the contract documents, and make sure that they include that prevailing wage language, um, and that you get a payment bond if, it's a, if it is a public work. Ask for help. A lot of these are, you know, are judgment calls to make. Pick up your phone, ask your legal counsel. Um, a lot of times I'll go down the hallway and vice versa. Mickey Morris and I are, 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 do a lot of procurement in our office. And on those hard judgment calls, you know, we'll call each other. Hey, what do you think about this? And we'll talk it out. Um, you know, some of these are bright line. You know, if you're repainting the wall into an existing facility, maintenance every time. You're refurbishing the gym, the already existing gym floor, maintenance every time. Um, but some of them, as you know, we discussed today, aren't subject to those bright line. Um, so definitely ask for help. 
Thank you guys so much for having me. Tom, if you have a question. What if you're using and doing improved wax? That's a better grade. If you're using a new, but even if it's new, remember that that goes back to my example of just because it's new doesn't mean that it falls into public work. Because you're using that new wax, why? To maintain the, and to you know, further the life of the gym floor. So that's considered to be maintenance. Yes, sir. Uh, the thing I always think of public works is that why there's so much scrutiny is because it involves the safety of the public. That's right. why it's a building. And many buildings, public, city, county, school district, have a lot of people in that building. So that's why electricity and, and, and walls. So, I mean, I would argue and that tearing down a wall in a building is public works because if you tear down the wrong wall, that building can collapse and hurts people. That's right. So I would argue the other way where demolition, you usually don't have anybody in that building to be demolished. So it's the same reason.
I'm going to talk about are first the uh, municipal advisor rules, which uh, implement part of Dodd Frank were uh, finally effective um, just two months ago. And the second is a new self reporting initiative that the SEC announced in March. The municipal advisor rules uh, technically don't regulate school districts. They only regulate financial advisors or underwriters who uh, provide advice to school districts as well as engineers or accountants or lawyers who provide advice to school districts. Um, but they will have an effect on school districts uh, because they could, resist, they could dry up the flow of information and free ideas like refunding candidates that you have historically gotten from prospective underwriters either directly or through your financial advisor. Uh, the MCBC initiative is, um, as I mentioned, a self-reporting initiative. Uh, since 1995, when you issue bonds, uh, the uh, underwriter is supposed to make sure that you describe in the offering document any instance in the last in the prior five years in which you have failed uh, to comply in any material respect with your obligation to provide continuing disclosure obligation, uh, continuing disclosure uh, information. And, um, and to the extent uh, you or underwriters have uh, either made or allowed to be reproduced a misstatement about prior compliance that might constitute a violation of federal securities laws. So the SEC has given school districts and underwriters and, and other municipal issuers an opportunity to self-report. And if you do, and the SEC decides it's a violation, you're, you're guaranteed a settlement that does not require any fine or other thing. We'll get into more detail on both of these. The self-reporting deadline for underwriters uh, is uh, a week from Monday. The, the self-reporting deadline for issuers uh, is December 1. So let's start with municipal advisor rules. Um, they were uh, adopted by the SEC uh, in response to uh, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Investor Protection Act, which was uh, uh, enacted, I guess, over four years now. Uh, and one section of that, uh, Section 975, any, any act that has 975 or more sections, you, you know is the trouble. Uh, all right, so Section 975 of Dodd-Frank uh, makes it a lawful crime to to act as a municipal advisor uh, unless the person is either registered with the SEC or complies with MSRB regulations or is exempt from registration. And a municipal advisor is defined as, as uh, a person or entity that provides advice to or on behalf of a school district or other uh, governmental entity with respect to the issuance of municipal securities, which is like issuing bonds, uh, or municipal financial products, which means uh, investments of bond proceeds or investments of money that might be bond proceeds uh, or derivative transactions. Uh, and, and, it, and it also includes certain uh, activities acting as a runner. Uh, it also, uh, that section imposes a fiduciary duty on anybody who acts as a municipal advisor to a school district unless they're exempt. So whether they're registered, whether they're registered or not, unless they're exempt, they have a fiduciary duty when they advise school districts about the issuance of municipal bonds or about uh, investments in bond proceeds. Uh, the act directs the municipal security rulemaking to adopt business conduct rules that regulate municipal advisors. Um, and among other things, they will prohibit under a conflicts of interest section uh, someone acting as advisor for simultaneously acting as a principal in a transaction for a school district. Uh, and and uh, in addition to civil penalties, uh, a, an 
entity that violates these regulations of mental liability uh, could be guilty of, of a criminal offense. So the SEC adopted, um, they proposed uh, three years ago, and finally uh, adopted uh, a year ago, uh, rules defining who is a municipal advisor, so adding some uh, details to the statute about when somebody's a municipal advisor and when they are not. Uh, and also have a register with the SEC. Um, those uh, provisions were originally supposed to be effective January uh, of this year, but then in response to uh, an outcry from regulated entities, uh, the effective date was postponed until this past July 1. Uh, in addition to the rules, there are there's a, a long proposing release that sort of uh, describes what the rules mean, and then there are frequently asked questions section on the SEC that, uh, website that's been updated twice that uh, give further explanations. And as I said, uh, while the rules only regulate people that give advice to school districts, they don't regulate school districts directly. They they can't have an impact. Uh, the MSRB, which I mentioned, is charged with adopting business conduct rules, um, uh, is in the process of laying out a whole series of rules to govern actions by municipal advisors. Uh, they initially proposed, and then in response to a lot of criticism, have modified and re-proposed uh, last month, uh, proposed rule 230. G42, which uh, defines the fiduciary duties, uh, imposes duties of care, and contains other business conduct rules, including prohibitions against conflict of interest, simultaneously acting as an advisor and a principal. In addition to that rule, the MSRB has proposed and is in the process of uh, uh, promulgating rules that require supervision of advisors prohibit, uh, put a ban on uh, so-called pay-to-play practices, so uh, sort of similar to the underwriting firm's uh, prohibition, it would limit their ability, the financial advisor's ability to make contributions to candidates for the school board uh, and then come back and, and do uh, uh, financial advice to the district. There are also limitations on gifts and gratuities. Um, that financial advisors can make similar, will be similar to the limitations on underwriting firms. Uh, and then uh, eventually, not, not yet, yes, the MSRB will get around to regulating people who act as runners for uh, municipal advisors uh, and for compensation to try to uh, solicit business for them. So again, the, rate, the, the conduct that makes somebody a municipal advisor giving advice, which the rules say is means a recommendation or some other express or implied call to action or inaction. Uh, if the advice uh, is uh, regarding the issuance of municipal securities, and somehow the SEC has interpreted that to include any advice once the, the, the bonds are issued and advice uh, before the bonds are issued. Uh, or investments of proceeds of municipal securities, uh, which includes direct proceeds or, or, or money that under IRS regulations are treated as proceeds because they're in an INS fund, um, or derivative transactions like interest rate swaps, caps, that sort of thing. Um, now, the investment of proceeds, most uh, most securities dealers who have brokerage accounts that they maintain for school districts or, or uh, other governmental units don't know whether the money in that account is bond proceeds or something else. They now have a duty to make inquiry and to confirm that the proceeds, uh, that the, the money in that account are not proceeds because otherwise they will be severely limited in what they can say in offering investments. Uh, under the uh, Investment Company Act, the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, a broker can give in 
incidental advice to anybody buying a security or other investment without having to register as an investment advisor under this uh, other regulatory scheme. Um, so that, so if, if you call the broker and say, I want to buy one to two year obligation with federal credit, what's available and what would you recommend? They can, they can provide, without registering as an investment advisor, they can provide incidental advice saying, yeah, I've got these, these three that are available and I would recommend A instead of B. Uh, but there's no exception for incidental advice under the municipal advisor rules. So if, unless uh, a broker can determine, unless, unless they're already registered with investment advisor, which is unusual for a broker, a securities dealer, um, they have to determine and confirm that there's no bond proceeds in the account being invested. And if they can't confirm that, they can't even give you incidental advice. They can tell you, here, here are the securities we have, and here are the terms under which we're willing to sell them, but we can't um, handicap them for it. So if somebody is a municipal advisor, because they've given you advice and recommendations about one of these subjects, um, I mentioned there were fiduciary duties that prohibited uh, uh, limitations on principal transactions, other conflicts of interest. So, for example, uh, an underwriter who uh, may want to do a refunding bond issue for you and tells you about uh, uh, an opportunity, if they use the wrong words, and, and that implies that it's a recommendation to do the refunding issue, they are then barred from acting, uh, treated as your financial advisor effectively, and then barred from underwriting the refunding, which is probably the reason they had the conversation with you to begin with. Uh, so the consequences for the prospective underwriter of becoming an advisor are, are very bad. Uh, and so they will uh, all be very reluctant to have any meaningful conversation with you unless they can qualify for an exemption. So what are the exemptions that an underwriter uh, or others could qualify for? Well, there are exemptions for uh, public officials. When the rules were first proposed, it was only elected public officials uh, and, and, uh, and, and employees and not appointed uh, public officials that were that, um, that's now been modified. So any uh, any elected or appointed official or employee acting within the scope of his or her duties uh, would be exempt. Uh, for underwriters, uh, if they're actually engaged to act as an underwriter with a specific bond issue, and the advice they give you is within the scope of their duties as underwriter they would be exempt, but not before their pitch, and not after the bond issue was closed. If you send out an RFP or RFQ uh, and ask for uh, qualifications and other advice, thoughts about a transaction in the process of selecting an underwriter through that process, anyone who responds can give you advice in the response if uh, the RFP goes to the requisite number of people who are uh, you know, reasonably capable of doing the, the job. And then the last exemption for targeted at underwriters in particular um, is the so-called firm exemption, or exemption that applies to an underwriter that gives advice to a district that is represented by an independent registered municipal advisor. On this, the same aspects of the transaction which you're giving advice. So if you have a financial advisor uh, and the financial advisor registers as a municipal advisor and they're independent from uh, a prospective underwriter, if you do an exchange of letters with the underwriter under which you say, yes, uh, I'm represented by the financial advisor, I'm going to rely on the financial advisor's advice, and the underwriter sends you a letter saying, I'm not your advisor. Um, everything I tell you is to get business for myself. It's not in your own interest. Um, then 
then they can give you advice. Other exemptions are, there's exemptions for banks who, um, uh, for uh, extending bank credit, including by doing a, buying a direct purchase of uh, bonds. Exemption for registered swap dealers, uh, if they comply with the terms for another exemption under the Commodities and Futures uh, Act. Um, there's an exemption for registered investment advisors, which you mentioned, uh, talked about earlier. There's an exemption for accountants who give advice if it's limited to sort of accounting-related services. There's an exemption for engineers, but uh, very difficult to parse, so there's, uh, it doesn't apply to you so much, but for municipalities who look for great recommendations from engineers, uh, very touchy area. And most importantly, there's a, an exemption for attorneys who, uh, who give advice to a client um, and, and, and don't hold themselves out as a financial advisor either expressly or by giving advice that's primarily financial. You listen to that, Marcus. Right? So let's say a little bit more detail about two exemptions uh, for un the underwriters most likely to use the IRMA exemption and the underwriting exemption. The IRMA exemption, I mentioned uh, uh, you have to represent that you are represented by an independent advisor. Um, and, and actually you don't have, you have to represent your, uh, represented by an advisor and then the underwriter can determine whether they're registered and whether they're independent. But it's impossible for you to know whether they're independent it has to do with whether an employee moved from one firm to the other in the past two years. Um, and, uh, and the underwriter has to give you uh, representations back. There are, um, in the frequently asked questions, the SEC said, um, instead of mailing a letter to each prospective underwriter from whom you'd like to get advice, you can post a to whom you may concern letter on your uh, website, and uh, some of you have probably already done that. Uh, and the Texas MAC just actually has a website hosting uh, program set up now where you can post letters that would be easily found by the underwriting exemption, um, as I mentioned, uh, requires that the underwriter be engaged, and after getting a lot of negative comment on that provision, the SEC said, well, really what we meant engaged is um, that you intend to engage. Uh, even if your letter of intent is preliminary, non-exclusive, non-binding, terminable, and uh, was conditioned on school board or the financing structure. So it could be fairly the, the Latin term, that's loose and loose, uh, but it, it has to indicate an intent to use that firm as, a, as an underwriter. It has to express an intent to use the underwriter for a specific transaction, not for whatever deals we do over the next three years. Uh, and then the underwriter, even with that exemption, uh, unlike the IRMA exemption, um, where a financial advisor might be engaged for a broad range of services and the underwriter can give advice about any of those services, but the underwriting exemption, the advice that they can give you as an underwriter is, is limited to normal functions of an underwriter for getting that series of bonds issued, not perhaps other bonds are outstanding and so forth. So some uh, practical tips on how to deal with this. That, again, the, 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 um, the risk for school districts is that unless you can tell prospective underwriters qualify for exemptions, you may not have the benefit of recommendations from them, uh, either direct that you might receive directly or under, uh, as interpreted by the frequently asked questions, they can't even give a recommendation to your financial advisor uh, with, the, uh, with the suggestion that the financial advisor contact you, for example, and suggest a refund. So if you want to keep that sort of line of free information recommendations open, it's in your interest to help the underwriter qualify for an exemption. So, uh, so that's uh, one thing that you should do, either, either 
by doing an IRMA representation letter or, or doing a letter of intent to engage an underwriter for a specific underwriter. Um, there are some forms of those letters that the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, or CIFLA, have produced and recommended. As you might expect, they, um, they're favorable to underwriters and they include some suggested representations by issuers that the school district shouldn't make. Um, there's, there's also, and I, I think many of you would have received probably an email from the Municipal Advisory Council of Texas. Um, that non nonprofit group put together a sample layer that can be used for IRMA uh, representation, and it was vetted both by underwriters to make sure it would pass muster with them, but also with bond council in the state. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, I would recommend that rather than the CIFMA letter as a starting point. Um, it will take some time to exchange these letters and for other writers to know that they work. So um, it, it, it's advisable to stay ahead of the curve and, um, and particularly get the Irma letter out before you actually need the advice. Um, I mentioned you can post that, uh, that Irma representation letter on your website. Uh, Texas Mac, I think you might have done from the email that came out. Uh, has set up a web hosting service so you can upload your letter to the Texas Mac site and, um, and, and broker dealers who want to communicate with you can go there and easily, they'll know where to look, it'll be easy for them to find that letter without having to call you about it. Um, that service will also, if you, if you put an effective date in your letter, that's good, or, or an end date, it's good until August 31, 2015, they'll send you a tickler that it's about to expire and let you upload another letter. They'll also register uh, which underwriters have gone and looked at your letter, and they'll send them a tickler when the letter's about to expire. So it's, it's a pretty inventive service, I think. We've got a number of other recommendations. If you go on our website um, and actually just uh, search for municipal advisor, you'll find uh, a couple articles that uh, you can look at. Let's move now to the MCPC initiative. Um, it, uh, as I mentioned, extends to both issuers and underwriters. Uh, it does not offer relief to school board members or administrators. So while a, a school district that may have a concern and may have violated the securities laws by misrepresenting its prior compliance with continued disclosure undertakings, could file and, and, and self-report and make sure it doesn't get a, a really onerous uh, administrative action as a result of that. That filing will not protect, but the SEC came back and said, well, that was a really egregious statement, and the director of finance uh, or the superintendent um, should have prevented that. This does not protect them against a possible administrative action. Um, while it's open to all offerings, any offering that's more than five years old is protected by statute limitations. So the offerings uh, that really are being focused on by the underwriters initially, since they have the first uh, filing deadline, are ones that occurred in the last five years. The violations that could be self-reported, any material misstatement in the official statement about uh, compliance with the district's prior continuing disclosure I think the practice in Texas is to include an affirmative statement about prior compliance, that uh, the district has not been in a material non-compliance at any time in the last five years. Even if that affirmative statement is left out, if you tell an investor that they're going to get a, a continuing disclosure undertaking and you're going to file financials within six months after your fiscal year end, and you don't tell them that you've told them 
the last set of investors that and you've never done it. Uh, that, could, that could be an omission. So even if you don't say anything at all about it, you might still uh, be vulnerable to a claim that you violated the federal securities laws. So the SEC has a carrot and stick approach. The carrot is if you, um, uh, and actually this is an underwriter self-report by September, by September 10, or if you self-report by December 1, the self-reporting party uh, gets a, a lean settlement, and I'll describe that uh, in a minute. If you don't, in, in public statements, SEC enforcement staff has said they're going to, if they find somebody who violated uh, and didn't self-report, they're going to throw the book out. So the settlement terms, uh, if you do self-report, first off, SEC staff has said if you do self-report, uh, they will look at what you self-reported, then they will determine whether it deserves an administrative action, enforcement action. So you could self-report, well, we were 30 days late twice, and um, uh, so we reported in seven months instead of six months. And they may look at that and say, well, that's not material, in which case nothing else happens. But if you self-report um, for three years, we didn't do anything, and we didn't disclose that to our next set of investors, and they decide to bring an administrative action. Having self-reported, they will offer settlement terms, which will include a cease and desist order, which you agree not to send anymore. No monetary payment. You'll have to agree to adopt policies and procedures for continuing disclosure, which is a good idea anyway, even if you, if you haven't done it uh, already. Uh, and then, you, then there's the scarlet letter, the next five years, uh, each of your offering documents will have to include the fact that you are party to this cease and desist order. You'll be in good company if you are. Um, and, and, you have, and then the, the district has to agree with the SEC to cooperate as the SEC investigates whether anybody else violated the federal securities laws in connection with the offering, which could include your underwriter, could include underwriters employees who worked on it should have done due diligence. And it could, it could include, as I mentioned, your administrator, or your, your, your board, the board adopted a resolution approving uh, the official state. Uh, underwriters have, have a, civil, a similar a settlement offer to them that they really pay money. And depending on the uh, larger uh, underwriting firms, uh, cap of 500,000 as a result of most firms are going to hit that limit. Smaller firms are capped at smaller levels per firm. Uh, and so since most of them are going to hit that limit, they're going to be, they may be inclined to self-report things that are kind of marginal, but just to get their money's worth for the 500,000, they want to buy some protection for those where the SEC might think uh, there was a material violation. If the underwriter self-reports, it changes uh, the merits of you self-reporting. If the underwriter doesn't self-report, and you don't self-report, the odds are the SEC never finds it, because they're going to be so busy going through all the other stuff that was self-reported. And by the time they find it, the statute of limitations may have moved up and protect it. But if the underwriter self-reports, and it's a matter of it was egregious non-compliance that wasn't disclosed, uh, then, it, then it probably would be in the district's interest to self-report, because the legal in the haystack defense disappears because now the SEC knows about it. So now have to self-report before you have to decide whether to self-report. Are worried that if they don't self-report, you may self-report and they lose the legal in the haystack defense. Yes, sir. Is it five hundred thousand dollars? It's per firm.
other questions about that. So, yes, ma'am. They're not required to, but if there's an underwriter that would like to do business with your district again in the future, I think it's very likely that they will. Uh, I think it is also good practice, we'll get to that in a minute, maybe, the, maybe even the next slide, uh, to ask this, this next week, ask your, figure out who were the lead, the lead underwriters on your the deals you closed the last five years, and ask them to let you know whether or not they're self-reported. Uh, or you can, or you can wait till after September 10 and ask them after they decide. Mark, well, I, I think you also just want to add, that you really want to try and convince them not to self okay. yes. Ask the question, but don't try and advocate that they not do it because that. Mark, Marcus is bringing up the. the did everybody hear? And hey, Marcus said you, you can you can let them know whether you intend to self-report or not and why, but you shouldn't ask them not to self-report. Which is the Watergate example? What wasn't about the break-in; it was about the cover-up. So if you if you have a conversation with an underwriter, ask them not to self-report. They agree to it. That might be a new offense. Starts the five-year statute of limitations over again, um, and, and not not wise. Is there a, is there a public place you can go to see if if there is a self-report? I don't, I think most of the underwriters are going to file uh, their self-reports under a uh, attorney-client privilege confidentiality exemption to FOIA. So I don't think that will be available so publicly, but if you ask the underwriter whether they have self-reported you or not, they're almost certainly going to tell you. But are they, do they have to tell you? They don't have to tell you. Most well, certainly the issuers will be press release by the SEC immediately after you reach some of them. Of course, he Yes, but I don't know, you know, for example, if you had one of the larger underwriters, I mean, some, I, I was at a meeting up in New York um, on the legal advisory committee for SIPA uh, and for the group discussion about this, and one said, well, I have 2,000 offerings to the underwrote in the last five years we're going to have to review and I'm saying, but I've got 8,000. So, um, and, and um, I've got some visibility into the run rate on results of reviews for a couple firms. Um, and some of are going to be self-reporting a third as much or more of their transactions. So I don't know that there's going to be a list in the consent decree of the, of the transactions uh, that serve as a basis for it. But I wouldn't worry about not knowing whether they self-reported or not because uh, it's inconceivable to me that they wouldn't, first off, volunteer to you, and even if they don't, that they wouldn't respond to a question. So let me uh, get through, I think this is the last slide or next slide, um, some practical tips on how to deal with MCDC initiative. Uh, one is don't even start to think about well, let me say, don't decide whether to self-report or not until you know, until the underwriters have played their hand. Because if they have, you no longer the needle in the haystack. If, you, if they haven't, you may be, and that can be one of the key things you ought to take into account to decide whether to self-report. Um, you, uh, you ought to do, and you could wait, I guess, until the underwriters do it. Because if, if they do find something reportable and they do want to self-report your transaction, they're probably going to call you and say, this is what we found. Do you have some evidence that you actually made this filing or whatever, or something like that? So uh, they're going to do your work for you, but if you, but if you haven't heard from them, you may want to do your own review just to go back and look at uh, your prior compliance and make sure there's nothing really nothing real substantial in this those amount of um, If you find that there's been non-compliance, it's not of the footfall variety, then you ought to talk to your counsel uh, and get advice about whether to self-report or not. Uh, when you, if you self-report, uh, the form that has to be signed says it's your intent to accept the settlement terms if the SEC decides to bring an administrative action. 
So you'll have to take whatever steps you need to take to figure out what the district's intent would be, which may be going to the Board of Trustees uh, and, and getting uh, approval from them. Um, we think if you are going to self-report, it makes sense. One of, I mentioned one of the settlement terms is that you have to agree to adopt policy procedures uh, before, uh, as a result of, uh, I think it's within a year after uh, the consent decree. We think it makes sense to adopt policies if you haven't already done it, or, or and if you have it, review that and think about updating them or get, get legal advice on it. But if you adopt sound policies and procedures now, that takes away one of the things the SEC could accomplish by, by getting a consent decree and therefore makes it less likely on a borderline area of non-compliance that they'll choose to bring it and settle it with integrated action. Uh, and then we have, we have some other tips. Again, if you, could, if you go to our website and search for MCDC, you'll find a, a much longer uh, article That has a few other suggestions. Um, so I think that's all I had proposed to take. Are there any, any other questions? They're worth delaying lunch for? <laughs> if not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And uh, I want to mention to you, uh, uh, Marcus and I uh, worked on internal policies and procedures on how to uh, implement some of these changes. Um, I'll be sending out some some information out to you guys uh, in case you want to look at some of the things that we've done uh, to make sure that we comply with those requirements. Uh, and unfortunately, those policies really focus on one individual, which is whoever handles uh, your, whoever your finance officer is, uh, who's responsible to do this compliance, or it all revolves around, around that one individual. So I'll send out those uh, procedures, yes. When you do, maybe we send it to TASB too, so that they can run it through policy service and recommend that change to the statewide. Yeah, we'll, we'll kind of uh, get together, because it's uh, a lot of his work that we got together, and it's about, uh, what is a 10 page document. Uh, and I, you know, since we have a PFC, we have to do it for the PFC side as well. And we also, he, he helped us with the uh, IRS part of it, that there's a procedure dealing with the IRS as well. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. that. That this is gonna be a good part today. Five hours, so. 12.30, so we'll be here till 5.30, cases? Probably. 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 We, 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 will, we will have a, a homework assignment or two to cover the last couple of hours. Um, one of the things Jesus told me uh, when he asked me to do this class, uh, we had a quick discussion about are we just doing the same thing that we've always done before? Uh, or do we want to maybe ramp this up a little bit? And, and he said, Let, let's, let's try to make it intermediate. So what I want to do, th there's only so much you can talk about when you're talking about Public Funds Investment Act. We've only had one significant change uh, that, that is in any way noteworthy over the last, how long, 15 years, 14 years now. Uh, and, and it's one that, oddly enough, has no impact on any of us, maybe two of us, in the room. And, and it, that's only in theory. In practicality, it's probably had no impact on any of us. That's, that's one thing we will look at in here. But what I don't want to do today is what I've always done, which is go through the whole Public Funds Investment Act page by page. You've been there, you've done that. Some of you, many, many times, we're not going to do that today. We're going to go over a little list of highlights. There's one thing I want to go in there and point out, uh, although you probably already know it's there. Uh, and, and the one thing we're going to look at, maybe in depth in the act itself, is changes 
that we think need to be made. Uh, we were just talking a minute ago about changing the, the CPE requirement, the continuing education requirement. Uh, there are, certainly you have a valid complaint if you think 10 hours every two years when there haven't been any significant changes whatsoever so it's just the same training over and over, nothing new, nothing interesting. Um, if you think that requirement is getting to be onerous, think about a lot of other people out there that have to take the same training. Uh, and the best example I can think of is people who work for the county appraisal districts. Most of those people, that they, they're, they're governmental entities, they, they do have someone who is designated as an investment officer. A lot of them collect money in addition to appraising, but if they do collect money, they take it in, they pay it right back out, ASAP. They don't have any real money to invest, but they're governmental entity, so they have to have someone designated as an investment officer, so they have to have someone go take the training. For 10 hours. Typically, unless you're going to cram it all into one very long, painful day, and I've done that once before for the tax officers uh, in the past, I don't think we'll ever do that again. Uh, that permanently impaired all of us. You, that, that 10 hours takes two days. That's two days they are out of the office getting training on something that they're never going to utilize in their day-to-day -day job. So this training, you, you think it's irritating to you, this training drives them out of their mind. And, and the one thing that they, they landed on about four years ago was let, let's, let's at least knock it down to four or five hours after the initial 10-hour training, and that way we only lose one day out of the office. And so I went and talked to Rob Eisler, before, uh, before the last, was it the last session that he was not in? That, that was his first one not to be in. I went and talked to him several times. Finally, the light bulb kind of came on. Now, he's a bright guy. It's not that he didn't get it. He just wasn't interested in this topic until I browbeat him three or four different times. And then, then he got engaged in the conversation. The light bulb came on, and he, 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 he saw the light, first of all. You get your 10 hours of training, you've got your 10 hours of training. After that, you probably only need a quick refresher every couple of years. So he was agreeable to knock the requirement down to four hours after the initial 10. And there were some other things in here that are kind of pet peeves of mine that clean up in nature that he was agreeable to file in the form of the bill also. And then he got beat in the primary. Scuttled, scuttled my plans. And of course, I still had a number of months to find someone else, but I didn't find someone else to file the bill. But now I've got a representative uh, from my neighborhood in Pasadena, who I think her, her staff so far anyway, is interested in filing a bill that will make some changes and do some cleanup that doesn't cost the state any money. That's a big one. That's a big one for all. And will make her a little folk hero to all of us in the business. She, her staff likes that a lot. So I've got them engaged in the idea. We're kind of running short of time already because here in another two weeks, they're going to be in full election mode. But hopefully I can get them to file something. So what I want to do is take a list of things to them and I've already got an idea of what some of those are, but I want you to ferret through here a little bit and dig up some things that you think we can put on a list knowing that they are all negotiable except the one we're going to bury somewhere in the middle innocuously, which is going to be cutting the 10 hours of training after your subsequent 10 hours, your initial training, the subsequent training from 10 to 4 or 5. All the rest of it, bargaining chips. But some of them will have some some substance um, and may make it into the form of a bill. Well, what's going on out there right now? The 
already got your tax money in. You got a lot of investment activity going on right now. Did you get a big payment in August from the state? Already got that tucked away. Yeah, nice one. George K. Baum, little, little commercial here. Uh, George K. Baum, my firm, financial advisor to the Comptroller's Office on the tax revenue anticipation note that funded that. Get for me. Yeah, but you know the state, the state, just like you, revenues don't always evenly match the, the expenditures, and August, late August is a good time for them to issue that. That, that it covers a whole lot of different things that the state needs money for this time of year. But of course, the biggest piece is the schools. The August, September, and October payments uh, are going to constitute about 70% of what they're going to pay out all school year. So we've got a, gov gov a governor under indictment. I don't really care one way or the other. Uh, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, uh, so I just find it all kind of amusing. Um, Judge Dietz, the opinion was supposed to come out today. He jumped the gun, issued it yesterday, which I guess means he's probably in the lake house by now. Um, how, 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 do, how do you think that will impact us operationally and cash flow wise? This year, next year, anything at all? Maybe, maybe if the legislature actually takes the district court opinion as a spur to to action. Um, how many of you think they'll they'll actually increase funding in the next session because of this thing? I think they're going to wait until they go to the Supreme Court. This will bypass a appellate court and go straight to the Supreme Court because we all know it's going to wind up there anyway. And I think they will wait to see what the Supreme Court says. And that will be maybe 2015. I have a funny feeling we won't get a decision out of the Supreme Court on the district court decision until after the legislative session. Just have a funny feeling that's how it's going to happen. So, if we get the mandate then, likely summer of 2016 would be a special session at best. So, while, while we all looked at that yesterday and we thought, hooray, you know, the judge agrees, uh, which they always do. Harley Clark agreed back in 81, 79, in the first day of joint case. Judge uh, McCown agreed that to win two, three, and four. Now Dietz in West Orange Cove, and again, I don't know what. What do we call this lawsuit? We've had we've had a nice catchy little name for every lawsuit along the way. I called it the. I wanted to call it the kitchen sink lawsuit because I thought that one of the school, one or all of the school plaintiffs were going to eventually throw every complaint we ever possibly had against the school finance system into this case. Underfunding of TRS, just everything we could find. Uh, and so I was calling it the kitchen sink lawsuit. And, and, and I think they looked at all those different issues and then when they got time to go to court, their filing was pretty much the same as it was in West Orange Cove. Uh, just, we had all switched switched over to different groups and we had a few more interested groups in that. So I'm not sure what to call this lawsuit. It, if you think, I, I've, I've got to write something up on, on the, the whole case now that we finally have Judge Neese's opinion and, and I need a catchy name. So if something comes to you over the weekend, if you're sitting there watching a, a football game a catchy little name comes to you, text it to me, email it to me, uh, because I need that. I need that next week. What else is going on? A lot of bond elections, November 4th. 
Right now I have 19 cities on the ballot for about $1.7 billion, which is a lot. My list says there's 28 school districts, but I guarantee you there's more than that. There's, there's at least 32 I know of, but my list has 28 on there with bond elections totaling $3.7 billion. And there's some little bitty ones. There's, a, there's a, I think the smallest one is a five million dollar election. And then there's, who's got the biggest one? Katie, seven hundred twenty-eight million. Is that, is that the biggest one so far? I think it is. I think, I think it is. Got four community college districts spread out all over for around about a million dollars, a little over a billion dollars. One hospital district for only 44 million. So there's right there, just, just on the official list right now, there's over six and a half billion dollars on the ballot. That's, that's a lot of money. And then our session starts, of course, after the election we've got a lot of House members, about what, a third of the Senate, so that's nine of them up for election on November 4th also. And then, of course, our session gets started mid-January. What else is going on? Because if you don't have anything interesting going on, then we've got to start talking about investments eventually. That's not exciting. It's just not. Nothing? Kids are back to school? Anyone kicked anybody out of school already? No? There, there, I, I was reading on the internet this morning, there's a, there's a mom uh, who has a four-year-old, this is not even in Texas, a mom with a four-year-old in, enrolled in a private, I guess pre-K, and mom is already unhappy enough with the school that she has posted her unhappiness on her Facebook account enough already that the school has said, sorry, Junior, you're out of here. We're tired of your mom. We've had enough. It's the first week of school. How bad do you have to be to get tossed out in the first week? My gosh. I, I'm sure we've had what I used to call misunderstood youth already this week. First football games tonight. Oh, well, there's going to be a lot of misunderstanding tonight. Friday before Labor Day weekend. Okay. It's, instead of delving into the Public Funds Investment Act in detail, what I wanted to do was put together just a list of the important parts of it here. And, and one of the things we'll be good. If everyone ate the lunch, everyone had a baked potato, it was a great baked potato, was That's a lot of carbohydrates. I figured you've got about another 30 minutes and your eyes are going to start fluttering, little drool's going to trickle down, someone's going to pitch over backward in their chair. So in, in, in about 30 minutes or so, when those carbs really hit you, we, we may get up and jump around or switch sides, and, and, and we'll, we're going to do an exercise. Uh, a minimal exercise, not the world. Um, so, so we're going to have some activities to do to try to break this up a little bit. Now, I may have to go out and get some exercise physically. I need to make the tape too. The, the, if you dig through the Public Funds Investment Act and try to figure it out what is important to you. Uh, one of the first things, that, or, or just of interest, just stuff of interest, one of the first things I notice is that it applies to all local governments and some state agencies, but it doesn't actually apply to the state itself. Who else does it not apply to? Very important to our retirement. TRS, ERS, uh, all of the state, all of the different state agency pension funds do not apply to them because they can go do. When's the last time you looked at TRS's portfolio? 
a detailed list of what they have in their portfolio. Pages and pages and pages long. Very interesting stuff in there. I don't even know what some of that stuff is. Do we need to be concerned? No, I don't think so. No. Just checking. But all kinds of stuff, most of which stuff is stuff that we cannot purchase on behalf of the governments that we represent. So I've always found that kind of novel and interesting about the Public Funds Investment Act that the, the state has, in, in, in many cases over the years, put themselves in a position of saying, we're the state, we're in the optimal position. We don't like it when Washington interferes with us because we know what we're doing. But you little guys at the local level, you need some oversight. And we're the ones to exercise that oversight over you. Doesn't need to apply to us. But we're gonna throw this blanket of oversight on you. And it probably is a good thing that we have Public Funds Investment Act. Before we had this, before we had any of this, this passed in 1987, right? That sound familiar? Anyone been, was anyone in the business when this passed? Well, so there's about three of us. Mm -hmm. I was in school. I'm going to end up teaching this one day, and someone's going to say, I wasn't even born then. That's, that's when I'm ready to go with one bullet right there. Um, it, it, that day's coming, I hope. Um, what, what, could we, what could we purchase? What was legal for us to purchase before this? Before we had the Public Funds Investment Act that prescribed in detail what we can and in a few cases cannot buy. Well, if there's no law about what you can and can't buy, you can go buy anything, can't you? I, I think somewhere else there might have been a, a, a little smattering of a few different pieces of code about what was legal and what was not. I was talking to a guy who, who got in the business around 75 yesterday, and he was telling me how he was buying all this different stuff, and, the, and there, his, uh, or actually a guy at TEA got in a conversation with him and told him, oh, that one, that one you're doing there is not legal. And they had an argument about, of course, this is back before the internet, before you could just get on the internet and look it up, look up statutes. So they had to break out their books, call their attorneys, dig around. They couldn't find where it was illegal, but they just had a vague recollection that there were some things that were legal, some things that were not. But it certainly wasn't codified anywhere in one, one place in the law where you can easily reference it. I went to work for Alvin ISD in August of 1987, and Public Funds Investment Act had just passed, and it was about, I've got 30 pages here, it was about half of this. And my boss came in that morning and laid a big book called Bullets in 679 on my desk. He said, there's a lot of county stuff in there. Get, get familiar with that. And he looked at it kind of like it had the measles or something. Then he came in the afternoon, he had the 15 page thing, and he says, we, we, can invest, we can start investing our money in something besides CDs at the depository bank. Here, you go figure that out, go make us some money. So that was, that was my, my original introduction to the Public Funds Investment Act, was reading and finding out what, what we could buy and what we couldn't. And what was the rate then? <laughs> oh, that, well, actually, that first year that we could invest money, starting September 1 of 87, rates were pretty good. Re so I, I remember them being 10, 11, 12, 13-ish yeah. back then. For, yeah, for a couple of years, they were, they were pretty, pretty solid. I, I, I remember the first year we made more on very conservatively investing our portfolio, we made, we made enough to pay for five teachers 
and we had never made enough money to pay for even one teacher's salary. But of course, teachers were making 20,000 a year, 18, 19, 20,000 at the time. And uh, so, you know, for about five minutes, at the end of that year, I was I was I was a hero. <laughs> it, it didn't last long. <laughs> that, that, that was that was the disappointment. Here, I made you five times what you ever made before, and my little hero worship welcome only lasted five minutes. Man. And you know what we have learned over time is, if, if you make a lot of money on your portfolio, someone may pat you on the back. But then all you have done is build an expectation that you can continue to do that. And that's not always a good thing because when rates go up, you make more. And when they go down, people start asking questions. Why aren't you making what you made last year? What's wrong with you? So you don't necessarily get to be a hero for very long for making a lot of money. But what we found out is you, you, can, you can get to be the GOAT pretty quick if you lose money, or don't make, even don't make as much. Does anyone contract with a firm to manage all or part of your portfolio? Oh, that's right, John told me y'all were gonna do that this year. All of it, part of it? Part. part. Which part? Does that represent like a general fund money or bond money or both? both? 25 bonds and 25 bonds. Okay. And again, that's our core, less than core money. Yeah. So, so is that money that you you have that you can sit on for more than a year? So you don't need that for your current operation? Oh, never. That, good, that's, that's very good. Anyone ever thought about it? I mean, seriously, like put out an RFQ or RFP for investment management services? So what is your oversight now using a company like that? What is your role? Do you just review their reports and now that you get? They, they still have to notify me if they want to you know, make any changes. All that still has to, to, to be approved. They just make recommendations. We want to sell this. We want to buy that. But it has to go it's through. Still the yes. So do you take information from them to integrate into your quarterly report? Yes. So they're not preparing for you. You're still preparing your quarterly report. You just integrate. Well, I have to because I have other investments. Yeah, but yeah, you have other stuff under your they, control. They don't want to put their name on that. Yeah. <laughs> First requirement, if, if, you're, if you're reading sequentially through the act, first requirement, thing that you have to do, adopt an investment policy that's in writing, emphasize safety of principle and liquidity, address diversity, yield, maturity, quality of it. We all have that, we've all got our policy on the TASB website. Separate written strategies. We'll get into some of these details later. Second requirement, your board has to review the policy at least annually. And adopt a written document, order, whatever your preference is, affirming that they have reviewed it annually. Do you come up, there are some other requirements that the board has to do periodically also. Do you combine those all into one big action item? I know my board in Deer Park, they really couldn't care less. Unless there's a problem, then they would care deeply. But as long as there were no problems, they, they were good with taking the annual policy review, any changes to our designated investment officer list, authorized brokers and dealers, authorized training outlets, all those things that they had to take action on, putting them all on one big agenda item, having one little resolution that says, therefore, 
Whereas, whereas, therefore, blah, 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 just get it all over with at once. I think that the most time we ever spent discussing the whole thing was maybe 30 seconds. It pretty much was, oh yeah, I remember this, all in favor, all opposed, motion carries, next. Now that I'm a I'm going to start talking. Because when he starts talking, he just never stops. How, how often do you change your list of investment officers? Because you have to, you have to take action. The board has to take action to designate your investment officers. Do you do that every year? Yes? No? I uh, see it bobbing yes. If she might be falling asleep, but it looks like she's saying yes. Someone said no. Okay, so you take them to the board for approval every year. That's fine. Does the law say you have to do that? I hope not to. Uh, it probably... It, it, if you're going to designate your investment officers and, and you're not going to bring that list back for renewal every year, it probably is good if you specifically state in that resolution that these people are appointed until such time as either by name or position or both to make it evergreen. If, if you state these people are appointed until such time as they retire or are no longer in these positions or the board decides to replace them. If you just appoint them, if you just say, I, I appoint Joe as our designated investment officer, just leave it at that. And then that kind of begs the question, how long? If Sarah were still here, she would probably tell you, you either need to designate them for that year or make it evergreen, which which is to state clearly until such time, blah blah blah. Personal business relationship. There's there's an explanation of what constitutes a personal business relationship with a broker or a dealer. If you own, if you purchase, how much? Ten percent of their business or five thousand dollars worth of equity in their business or if you buy securities or holdings through them totaling how much two thousand is it twenty five hundred or two thousand I think it's twenty five hundred worth of securities through them then you have a personal business relationship and is that okay? Can you can you can you do business with someone on behalf of the school district that you have a personal business relationship with? I would, oh, okay, but can you? Can that first question is can you? Can you do it? Yes, you can do it. You have to disclose it. Do you really want to be in that position? No. I I I don't. I don't. But, all you, but you can do it, you just have to disclose it to your board and Texas Ethics Commission. I was trying to, trying to be clever and think of it without looking. It's in here. It's, it, it's in the packet. Um, I just don't want to make that disclosure. I don't want to put myself in that position. I don't want to put that broker, if I like who they are, if I like them, I don't want to put them in that position. I don't want to jeopardize whatever we're doing with the school's portfolio, which is certainly many, many times larger than mine will ever be. Um, it, it, it just seems like, it just seems like painting a bullseye on yourself for no good reason. Why, why would you do that? Broker, broker dealer opens an office down the street and gets all fired up and runs down there and knocks on your door and says, hey, just open an office down here and man, I'm excited. I want to do business with your school district. Right now, what do you do? What's the first thing you're going to do? Tell them, sit down, shut up. I want to talk to you. Listen. 
here's our investment policy. Go read this, and if it doesn't scare you off, come back. Come back tomorrow. What else? What, else? what, what, are, what are you going to ask them for before you're even going to think about doing business with them? You probably have a form that they're going to fill out and sign and ask for some something. What, what are you going to ask them for? Do what? An annual report, uh, a quarterly, what are those? Uh, 10 Ks? If, if, they're, if they're a public firm. Uh, somewhere you're going to ask them to sign a form that says they they have read your policy, they understand your policy, those two different things, it's easy enough to read, uh, it doesn't always soak in the first time, and the one that their attorneys always cough up blood on them, that they will take reasonable precautions necessary to make sure they don't offer to sell you something that their policy says you're not supposed to be buying. That's the one their legal department spits out more often than not, if they if they think to send it to someone in the legal department. Had that I've had that discussion in the in the very distant past with the with some attorney who worked for some brokerage firm who said, Oh, we, we've got a red line that said, Well, we can sign the form, but well, we got a red line in the sentence. And that's why I tell them it's it's kind of all or nothing. You got to redline it, then you might as well crumple it up, toss it in the trash because that's what I'm going to do with it. But let's say they, they bring you all the little things that you want, copies of their broker license, uh, whatever it is you need to review and feel good about who they are, and and they sign your, your form saying they've read your policy, they understand, they will take reasonable precautions. You still have to get them on the list, don't you? How can you take your list of authorized broker dealers to the board? Once a year? What if someone comes in that you really want to do business with? Or you've got someone you're doing business with and have been for a long time and they switch firms? Go, go back go back to the board and ask them to amend it. That, that is that a is that a common occurrence? Betting is probably not. It's not something, one way or the other, you're probably not asking your board to deal with that list two, three, four times a year, are you? What, once, I, I want my list on that agenda once a year. And if someone comes in two days after we approve this year's list, I'm probably going to tell them, sign this form, give me all the stuff that I'm asking for, and, you know, next summer, We'll think about it. You might make the list, you might not, but we do the list once a year in September or August or wherever you do it, and, and that's it. If you miss this year, sorry, you gotta wait till next year at best. Compliance audit, as part of your annual financial audit, your auditors are going to uh, and, and, it, and it's transparent to you because the audit is the audit, but it's a separate component to them. They're going to do an audit uh, of your cash management and investment controls, and they're going to make sure, they're going to look at a handful of things. They're going to look to see if you got your training, if you get your 10 hours in two years. They're, what else are they going to look at? They're going to look at your portfolio, not just what you have at year end, but if, if they're diligent, they're going to go back and look at everything you had at some point during the year, make sure it complies with Public Funds Investment Act. What else are they going to look at? Collateral. collateral. We, we've got the Public Funds Collateral Act uh, that I've got summarized in here also. Uh, we'll look at that here a little bit. And that, so they're going to they're going to look and make sure you were collateralized. Are, are they going to look at every single day to make sure you were collateralized? They're, they're probably going to look at two days, year in, last business day of the year, and your high cash balance day, which is typically for most of us going to be 
into January, 1st of February. Maybe, maybe not. Got other high cash balance days. Depends on your, your which state payment schedule you're on. Um, you know, high cash balance day for a very low tax wealth district could be right about August, or I'm sorry, October 25th or so. You got your August payment, you got your September payment, now you got your October payment. That, that might, if you're very low wealth, that might be your high cash balance day if you've stopped all those previous payments. So they're going to look at those two, and if if for some reason you had this big inflow, a big taxpayer came in and paid on January 31st, and the bank came in on February 1st and said, that was a lot, we didn't have enough collateral, we better get something pledged quick. But they didn't have you pledged on that day, and they were actually short, so someone needs their hand slapped, I'd start with the bank. Who's who's going to get nicked in the audit report, though? You, you are. And the auditors are going to show up at a board meeting in open session and say, "We did fine," and then everyone's going to look at you. And you know what they're thinking. You know what you know what the layman board members who are astute business people, but they're not school finance people. You know what they're thinking. something like this happen. Or worse, they start that wagging the finger thing. I've had that before. I tell you what, someone's going to wag a finger at me in open session, someone else is going to get a beating tomorrow. I'm going to see the bank and it's going to be ugly. That, that finger wagging, that, that flows straight downhill. That is the bank's job. But if they don't do their job, you get nicked for it. You're the one that's going to look like you fell down on the job. So how do you monitor that? How do you make sure you don't have some fluke day where, oops, they under collateralized you? We are actually required by law to inform our bank of any significant changes in our cash balance. Public Funds Collateral Act actually says we are required to let them know in advance. It doesn't say how far in advance, but to let them know in advance of any significant changes in our cash flows so that they can adequately collateralize. So if you wanted to deflect the blame formally for that issue, and I'm thinking about how the auditors are going to write this up in the audit report, if you are under collateralized, I might want to inform them in writing. Now, I may pick up the phone and call my banker and say, hey, don't forget, you know, we're here in the middle of January here, and over the next two weeks, boom, big tax deposits, big money, probably through the first part of February, first week of February, you better ramp up that collateral. I'm gonna hang up that phone, I'm gonna follow that up with an email. I'm absolutely going to follow that up with an email so that I've left a trail. As per our conversation earlier today, don't forget, and then when my auditor finds out that we were under collateralized, I might be able to twist their arm and convince them that when they write that up in the audit report, they need to pinpoint where that blame came from, where that blame belongs. Might deflect the, the, audit, the audit finding a little bit. We're not supposed to invest for speculate, speculative purposes. And I think that's only covered once in the act. Speculation is addressed one time, not very thoroughly. All it says is, don't speculate. 
So what does it say to do if you can't speculate? If, you can't, if you're not investing for speculative purposes, what are you investing for? Safety, preservation of capital, liquidity, So who's going to look at your portfolio and know diversity? Who's going to look and know, oh yeah, cash flow, cash flow, safety, 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 diversity, diversity. Oh yeah, a lot of diversity there. I don't even know what that is. Oh, that looks speculative. That one, hmm, got to ask about. How, who's going to know? Who's going to know if you bought something for speculative? What constitutes a security that is speculative? Nothing, nothing in here, nothing in here that says what is and what is not speculative. Uh, I always bought investments, and most of you do too. I, I buy some investments, and, and I more or less target the maturities to coincide when I think I'm going to need the money. I pay once a month, I've got a big payroll at the end of the month, so I'm going to put a big chunk out to cover that more or less into the month. I'll call my broker and say, I've got X number of millions of dollars, I need it back on or before the 25th because I've got payroll on the 27th. And I may do that in lesser amounts, maybe more often for accounts payable, especially when I have construction as part of that and I know sort of when I'm gonna need a lot of that back. Some people may just barbell their, and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll get to this. Wouldn't that be terrible with the power? <laughs> it would be a tragedy, a tragedy. <laughs> some people will barbell their money. I'm gonna put some of it in a pool. I'm gonna put a big chunk, I'm gonna put 20% in the pool just sort of a, a reservation because things happen that I don't plan for, didn't know to plan for, so I've, I've got my little pot of money right here, and then I'm gonna just kind of take some out every month, every month, every month, every month, and after, I don't you know, the farther out you get, month by month, the more uncertain people get, okay, I'm out here six months, ah, that's as far as I wanna go, so I'm just gonna take all the rest of it, I want to plop it out there in seven months. And I could go out farther, but I just don't feel safe doing it. So now I've got this big piece, and little pieces, little pieces, but I've got a big piece. Looks like a barbell. What are you going to do with that big piece? I don't know. Is that, is that speculative? You don't have it assigned to anything. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that later. I think, I think when you don't have something specific to match it to, it, it, that starts to set, if you buy a security, if someone calls and says, I got this, I got the yield, Jeannie said yield, if, if you've got a big piece out there that has a yield that looks disproportionate to everything else, and you don't have something specific you're assigning that to, a specific expenditure, that, that sort of looks speculative to me, but who's going to know besides you? I think nobody. There's a, there's a handful of things in here that I think should change because they're, they're, they're unmonitorable. Not, not even the auditors could look at it and decipher whether or not it's speculative or, you know, one of the things in the Collateral Act is you can't have collateral pledged to your account that is a high-risk security. And we've all read the definition and had our eyes cross over the definition in the law of what constitutes a high-risk security. We'll look at that briefly later on. Um, and, and, and I, we understand the, the mathematics of the definition, but then my question is, my practical issue is, 
Who's going to know? If you've got securities placed in your account, who's going to tell you, oh, that, one, that one's high risk? Look at the Public Lands Collateral Act and run your scenarios on the Bloomberg. You'll see that's high risk. That I don't know who would be monitoring that. got authorized investments, you know what the list is. The list is the, the only thing that's changed, and we'll look at that here in just one second. Uh, but the list is pretty much the list. Uh, has anyone bought, at some point in time, have you bought at least one of all of these before? You've got all the different obligations of the United States or other states. Can, I, can, can you buy, if the city of Austin is selling bonds, can you buy City of Austin bonds? Can you buy City of Wilmington, Delaware bonds? Yeah. Law says you can. Uh, can you buy your own bonds? If you are selling bonds, the proceeds of which go into a capital project fund, the repayment of which comes from your debt service fund, can you take M&O funds or agency funds or self-funded health insurance funds and buy your own bonds. I think what your auditors might tell you is that that is a whole different animal. That is a de facto defeasance or retirement of bonds when you buy your own bonds, even if you're buying them with a source of funds that has nothing to do with your bonds. When you buy your own, you're basically retiring the debt. And that's a whole different set of accounting entries. So even though you certainly have reason to believe you are a good investment, you probably don't want to buy your own bonds. Uh, and I've actually had three different auditors who work on a lot of our different accounts tell me the same thing. So uh, I'm inclined to believe they're probably right. Bonds issued assumed or guaranteed by the state of Israel. Who's bought one before? Anybody? Can, can you get one? If you want one, have you ever called a broker and said, I just got me a hankering for a bond guaranteed by the state of Israel. Go get me one. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at one point, I think you could actually buy some Israeli government bonds online. And actually, I think it was kind of easy. But the thing is, the, the ones I could find that I thought were, looked easy, I'm not sure I was buying what I, or I was going to buy what I, what I thought it was. Because, you know, it's so easy to make things look like something they're not on the internet. But... What I could see was two and a half to five years out there in the churches. They didn't have anything that was three months or six months or nine months. Um, so there wasn't anything that I could find that looked like a bond issued to assume you're guaranteed by the state of Israel that would have fit my very short term portfolio. It was all way out there. Um, Wouldn't that be considered high risk? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got it on my list. I, I wanted to, you know, I brought that up just to, to raise the awareness there. But just out of curiosity, if any of you ever called your broker and said, I'm going to like one. Go get me one. I need an owner, owner before January 31st. I, I don't think they can find them. I think if you call your broker Monday and say, hey, last Friday we were talking about this. Just for the heck of it, go see if you can find the one. They're going to call you back in about three hours and they're going to say, we don't know what you're talking about. I don't think it's out there. Now, I was actually in the committee meeting late one night, probably by then early one morning, when they discussed whether or not to add this. And it was a very brief discussion. And uh, the, the one part of the discussion that did not occur was, why? 
why do we need this? Why is this good for all of our taxi entities to be able to buy this? It was more of a geopolitical discussion at the time, and it didn't last very long, and it got voted out of committee, and it just blew through the House and the Senate, got signed by the governor, <coughs> all with very little discussion or fanfare. And I was, you know, at the end of the session, I'm still sitting there thinking, I don't understand why. Well, why that needs to be on our list, but it is, and probably, I, I don't want to go to Austin and start a political firestorm, but if it's not something we can even find to buy, then my question is, it, it's not an issue of quality or politics or prejudice or anything. Um, it, it, if I can't find it to buy it, doesn't need to be on our list. So that would be one of the little brokerage chips I, I would put on the list. So put a little asterisk there. And we wrap up today. We'll uh, we'll make a list of the of the bargaining chips we're going to put on our list. Corporate bonds. That's the one thing that has changed. That was added in 2011. And let's see. That is. It's on page 26 of my handout. Page numbers being in the upper right hand corner. I'm not sure what. I don't think we have any handouts. Oh, it's, uh, it it's, was part of it. I think the only place it is is on the electronic. Oh, see, ask everybody here to be here. Is that what you're looking at? Or are you doing uh, crossword puzzle? No. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, yeah. We, we have we got added this is I really should take off the microphone to tell the story um, Senate Bill 1543 in the 82nd session which is not last year but 2011 session there was there was a lot of teeth gnashing and arm wrestling going on about adding the corporate bond that, that's the newest one, and it's, it's coming up on three years old now. Corporate bonds that we can purchase. And the oddity about the corporate bonds is it was added for school districts only. And what I thought was even more odd is cities, counties, other taxing entities, None of them said a word. None of them came to the committee meeting and raised their hand and said, hey, if it's good enough for a school district, how come it's not good enough for us? How come it's good enough for Austin ISD, but it's not good enough for the city of Austin? If it's that good of a deal, if it's, if it's a safe yield enhancer, uh, we want in on the fun too. None of that. Not one peep from the non-school district people. It, it gets better, yes sir. I'm from a charter school and maybe for, for the purpose of this uh, message that ISD means charter schools as well? Or yes. We have, have, have you got money to invest? Do you invest money? We have money to invest. You're with Harmony. 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 Okay. Yeah. You guys do have some money to invest. Um, you're you're kind of in the same boat with my my tax collector people, my uh, appraisers. Um, you know, below a certain threshold, you just really don't have money to go out and build a diverse, a safe portfolio, and then then you're sitting here getting this training, thinking. I got some. I got stuff piling up, piling up back at the office. Gonna have to go in on Saturday, get it done. Um, so, yeah, and, and you have to get ten hours. So, you know, even though it's painful, if you can cut that to four.
still better than 10. It's still going to be four hours you're going to essentially waste, um, which is why we're going to try to talk about some other stuff other than just investments to make it at least partially worth your while. But it gets better. It gets better. The corporate bonds are not just for school districts. They are for... Let me find it. Oh, only to independent school districts that qualify as an issuer as defined by Section 1371.001 of the Texas Government Code. What do you think that section says? Some of you know. Average daily attendance. Not weighted average, not enrollment. But weighted, or, but average daily attendance of fifty thousand students or more. That was the big discussion on the corporate bond issue. Not why is it just school districts? Why isn't it everybody? But should it be average daily attendance of fifty thousand or gross bonded debt outstanding of one hundred million dollars or more? That was the big debate. Where those two numbers came from, I don't know. Somebody just made them up. But that was the big debate. And at one point, it I thought the consensus was going to be one or the other. If you had $100 million in gross bond in debt or more, you were in. If you had 50,000 students in average daily attendance, you were, you were in. You were covered. Either way. And then somewhere... The bonded debt fell off, and the only thing was survived. So, the only people who can buy corporate bonds are school districts with average daily attendance of 50,000 students or more. How many is that? 35? 40? Maybe 45 school districts in the whole state out of how many? 1,000 and number no, shrinking. 26, no, about somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,030, plus or minus a couple, 35, 40, maybe 45 school districts. No cities, no counties, no hospital districts, no drainage, and no one, nobody else but those 45 or less school districts. How many of them do you think have bought corporate bonds so far? I, I know of one. Now, the the man who really hammered most of this out and pushed it through the session, the school district person who was interested in doing it. You, some of you know the rest of the story. That's that's the part I need to. He was so excited when this passed. That now, if if it whatever it is, corporate bonds. Whatever. If there's a new investment that gets passed, that, that is now legal for you to buy, and you're excited and eager to buy it, first it's got to pass into law and get signed by the governor and go into effect typically September 1. So if it passes both houses in early May, you can't go out and buy it in early May yet, can you? Yep, got to wait for the governor to sign it. Then you got to wait for its effective date, which is typically September 1. Not always, but typically. What else do you have to do before you can go buy it after September 1? Go ahead to approve it as a... It's got to be approved in your policy. The guy who ramrodded this through was so excited. As soon as September 1 came, they went to their board of trustees with a policy update in September, local, and they had their first reading. And he's so excited after the first reading, he went and bought a corporate bond. And a month later, they had second reading and passed it. So as of that moment, probably October 15th, more or less, that corporate bond was legal to buy. He'd already bought it. Was it a legal investment to buy before the second reading and approval by the board? No, sure wasn't. 
somebody had to go to the, the woodshed over that, and the penalty was severe. So the one person who wanted to do this, really, and, and you know, the funny thing was all during the legislative session when so many of us were, were saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, and what about, what about all these others, and what about the rest of us? How come it's good for you and it's not good for us? The one guy who was pushing it through, got it done, <coughs> went and did it, for it. I think that's kind of ironic. More than 50,000. <laughs> <laughs> like, is it like one, two, or three? Number one, or two? No, no. Uh, not, not where it happened. No. About 180 miles due west of here. I, I would put, just for information only, as a bargaining chip on our list that we'll make later. I, I would put the corporate bond on there. Uh, I would think that would probably fall off pretty quickly just because of all the time and effort they went through two years, four years ago, three now, but four by the time we get to this, to get it in there. But hey, there's so many new people in the house last session. A third of the house were rookies last session. We may have another third turnover or come in new this next time too, that will all be new to them. They won't remember it. That, that's, that's one of the problems we've had over the decades in the school business is the legislature wants to try something new, something clever and cute, and, and pump, shut it down our throats in education, and we have to go up there and tell them, you guys tried this 20 years ago. Didn't work. So this is not a new idea. Well, you know, some of those legislators, uh, most of which are very bright, some, some of them are pretty young. My legislator in Pasadena, when I got in this business, she was in junior high. She didn't remember some of this stuff because she, she never knew it. I would put the corporate bonds on the list as a bargaining chip, knowing that, that, one, that one can fall off and I'll be okay with that, but I'll, I'll put it on the list. Quarterly reporting, you gotta do your quarterly report. Uh, we used to have a requirement for an annual report. Y'all remember that? And then somewhere very quietly, that fell off. And there I am in my office toiling away in September, putting together my annual report. One of you called me. Somebody called me. Someone who'd been around school business and I, I would, I would bet even money on it being Ryan and and said what are you doing and I said I'll put my annual report together and they said eh, you know you don't have to do that anymore they removed that requirement a couple of sessions ago and I was honest I said I know that I just like to do it <laughs> I, I, I very rarely have they changed anything in here, and I can honestly say I knew nothing. I missed it completely. That one, I missed. Four years later, I'm still toiling away over an annual report that looks an awful lot like my last four quarterly reports. It's just got a lot more data in it. And, and then someone called me up and says, uh, I'm in the T-set class, so surely you know took that requirement out. Yeah. And selection of authorized broker dealers, we'll talk about that. Okay. Take a break, five minutes, 10 minutes or so, stretch. When we come back, uh, I'm gonna let y'all comb through here briefly and, and we'll make our laundry list of things that we need to change. Okay, oh, real quick. Is that your computer? No. 15 minute exercise. Those of you over here, you'll compact down here in one area. 
that's going to be one group. These two tables, maybe y'all meet in the middle here at Sonia. That's another group. Five of you here, one group. It's only for 15 minutes. Um, all right, wait, we've got, we've got one computer. Then we've got a, you've got public funds invested in that. You've got a statute, statute here. Okay. Yeah, you can do this from memory. Does anyone have a computer over here or a paper copy? Uh, Public Funds Investment Act, or this handout. <laughs> I'll get you one. Who is this? Oh, good. Okay, we got one right here. Uh, what I want you to do is scroll through, find me a list of things that we want to add. Uh, take 15, 10, 15 minutes to come up with your list. Obviously, we're going to have some overlap. We're adding or we're getting rid of? No, well, either one. Uh, now, finding things that would need to be added into the act is a little harder. Do you want to pull up the act? Yeah, if you can. And, and let, it, it's easier to find things that are in it that you would like to take out or change, but it, if something has occurred to you before or you've just had inspiration all of a sudden and there's something you think we need to add and put that on your list 